Well, good evening, everybody. I make that 6.30. So welcome to March's meeting of the Community Environment and Partnerships Committee. Um, I just need to read out the fire evacuation proceedings, uh, procedures for this evening. There are no fire alarms scheduled this evening. Therefore, if the fire alarm sounds, please evacuate the building immediately. The fire exit is located at the side of this room, exit through reception and then meet in the War Memorial Park. This meeting is being webcast live on the internet and will be available to view on YouTube after the meeting. Is that working? That's it. Um, and now just a courtesy, please do switch your mobile phones off or turn them to silent for the evening. Thank you. So we have quite a packed agenda this evening, so I will try and keep us on track and focused. Um, but let's start with some substitutions. So Councillor Court has been replaced by Councillor Carruthers this evening and Councillor Wooldridge has been replaced by Councillor McCormick. Are there any other apologies for absence or substitutions? I think Councillor Mama Mullaney will be joining us shortly. Um, he's not here yet, but he is on his way. Are there any declarations of interest this evening? Okay, no declarations of interest. Um, there are also no urgent matters this evening, um, which means we can then go on to the minutes. Are the committee agreed that the minutes of the meeting held on the 13th of March 2019 an accurate record? No, that's uh, the 19th of January 2022, an accurate record, sorry. Excellent, lovely, thank you. I will sign those at the end of the meeting. So that brings us on to our first main event, presentation by Anvil Arts. Um, so Councillor Bean, I'll ask you to introduce. Yes, thank you. So um, I am pleased to introduce both Matthew Cleaver, um, Chief Executive, and Chris Smith, who is Chair of the Board of Trustees, who are here this evening to give us an update on the work of Anvil Arts and their plans for the future. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction and thank you all for the invitation. Uh, I'm Chris Smith. I'm the um, new chair. Well, it doesn't feel new, actually. I'm the nearly old chair of Anvil Trust. Um, and this is my first opportunity to discuss, uh, to present anything to the local authority, which is um, at council level, which is great news. A, a little bit of an introduction. Um, I have worked in the arts and culture sector for about 35 years. Um, involved in venue management, um, venue fundraising, building venues, running venues. I currently am director of a company who does um, international events. Uh, last weekend we were in Australia, though I personally wasn't. Our next festival and event is in Chile. So, and the reason I share this with you is just to show that I've become involved uh, in supporting the work of the Anvil because it's, it's something I'm very passionate about. I think it's very important to our communities um, and to society as a as a rule, as a whole. Um, on my uh, right, you have Matthew, who is the CEO of the Anvil Trust. Uh, Matthew, there's nothing he doesn't know about the Anvil. He has been there for 30 years, um, and I've known him for quite a lot of those. Uh, so we, we feel we have a strong um, working relationship. But perhaps more significantly is I'm also a local resident. And I, I say that is, is relevant because I think the journey that I had to get involved with the Anvil Arts is, is, and to become part of the community of uh, Basingstoke and Dean is very typical of, of what's happening currently and how our community is changing. So I've lived in um, Basingstoke, Basingstoke and Dean for close to 25 years. I brought up uh, three children here um, and I fully engaged in, in the experiences that the town offers. Uh, my kids learned to swim in the leisure centre. I remember sitting there for hours on a Saturday morning praying it would end. Um, uh, they got involved in arts events, they got involved in sports events, um, and also we moved to this borough because my wife works at the BBC in London and I worked in Reading, so again it was an opportunity to commute. So I feel um, I'm representative of, of the people that you are representing, um, and I value what Basin and Dean gave me as a resident. And I think from my short time involved with the Trust, um, people even the, even the local authority is massively underestimating the achievements you've made in uh, the Anvil existing, the Anvil Trust existing. Uh, when I started my career 
if I saw an advert to come and work in Basingstoke in the arts, I would, you know, I'd be very excited about it. But I knew I'd never get it because the competition would be too high and the salary was good. And it, it was a real highlight to be part of the arts and culture of, of this borough. And then, of course, the investment in the Anvil, the work in the Haymarket. These were real um, flagships in, in, in our industry and um, around the country. And that's something you should all be very proud of. Um, and uh, I'm very proud of that as both the chair and as, and as a local resident. But, of course, the world has changed. <laughs> Um, the last two years have decimated our industry, um, they've decimated our communities and, and part of our sector. So at the end of the Trust, we are very much looking forward to how we continue to grow, continue to be part of um, and make a strong contribution to the regeneration of, of the town. Um, we're going to really, I was privileged to get a preview of the um, uh, framework for the arts and uh, you're going to hear a lot about ease to tonight. Uh, and we very much picked up on three themes that we think is relevant to what the trust is all about. And that's the cultural e um, ecosystem, the cultural economy, and uh, cultural excellence. And what, what you'll see up on the screen are, these, these aren't part of the presentation, as in we're not, I'm not referring to these. These are just pointers when you get bored with me or Matthew. Um, you, there's things to look at. Uh, and it, we also think it's an insight into the work that we're doing, both in the community and in terms of our financial um, and business sector. So. I'm just very briefly on, on how we view the ecosystem because we're very much part of it and the reason Basingstoke and Dean has such a strong artistic community is because of investment but also because of time um, and these organisations have had the funding but also the um, resources to, to grow and become leaders in their field around the country. There are a significant number of Arts Council funded organisations working in the community um, and we feel that the Anvil Trust is very much part of that ecosystem and we're very excited to be part of that. Matthew's now going to talk a little bit about some of the elements of the ecosystem and our role within it that possibly you're not aware of, uh, but we think are very important. So yes, we thought it would be, it would be useful to lead with, with a part of our work that is actually often overlooked and it's difficult to get a, a strong public profile for it. It's not always reported in the press. Um, and it gives us no financial return because all the costs are borne by us, and that, uh, but nonetheless is a really, really important part of what we do. Um, and that's our community engagement projects. Um, we run a, a whole range of different projects, um, and I just wanted to, to take the opportunity to tell you about some of them, um, and then go on to talk a bit more, as Chris said, about the, 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 the sort of cultural ecosystem and our, and our place in that. So. Some of those are, in fact, the world at large is the first one that I was going to talk about, which we ran um, earlier this month at Greenfield School. Um, before that, we, uh, before the pandemic, we did it at Merton School in Potley. Um, it's a week-long uh, project which uh, engages with a whole year group, so 90 to 100 children at a time, for primary schools using music, drama, and storytelling, specifically to highlight and reinforce school values and learning behaviours. Um, and uh, it's, it's certainly a, a very popular thing, um, and the, the demand for it is, is, is you know, very, very strong. Um, the next one is Orchestra Unwrapped, um, which is a specially devised participatory schools concert, which we work with the Flamonia Orchestra, who are one of our regular uh, orchestras, um, for Key Stage 2, where a, th a thousand children in the anvil experience the power and excitement of a of a full symphony orchestra. Um, it's not just a sit back and listen concert. Um, before the before the event, there's inset training for teachers. So um, they teach all in the schools. They will teach a new piece, um, which all the schools will then sing together on the day of the concert. Um, we again ran this most recently earlier this month. Um, of the 14 schools that were attending, um, the Basingstoke schools were represented by St Mary's, uh, Kempshot, Bishopswood, Southview and Oakley. And that's something that happens uh, every year. I think that this was the eighth time that we've done it. So it's, it's uh, you know, building up quite a, a, a tradition as um, that first experience uh, for many children of, of uh, orchestral music. Um, on a, on a, at the other end of the, the age spectrum, if you like, um, there's a, a project called Finding Words, 
um, which is uh, something that we've been running for people with dementia, um, supported obviously by carers and, and their families. Um, and this is an 18 week long project um, which involves uh, music, writing and movement and dance. Um, the reason it's 18 weeks long is obviously this is very um, uh, painstaking work. We send the team into, into different care homes for, for, for that length of time. And at the end of that, um, there's a sharing performance um, from the participants for families and, and carers, uh, which takes place in the forge at the anvil. Um, and so the, the two most recent incarnations of that were uh, um, obviously pre-pandemic. This is uh, at Applewood Care Home in Tadley and Newman Court in Brighton Hill. Um, but I'm pleased to say we're doing a pilot version at Viables um, this week to see if that's something which we can we can take further there. Um, we also have relaxed performances, which again are very important. Relaxed performances um, of pantomime and of children's theatre productions at the Haymarket. Um, and these are performance which, performances which are specifically designed uh, for um, all people with, with um, uh, vary, a range of, 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 of disabilities. Um, the performance is um, gentler in tone, the lighting is kept on, um, people can come in and out of the auditorium as is necessary. Uh, what it means is that families um, can bring all of their children together and that's something which is often difficult for, um, for, for people to do uh, in a supportive and friendly atmosphere. We work with Autism Hampshire um, in terms of uh, making sure that um, each successive uh, pantomime script particularly is uh, um, uh, adapted in order to make the most of, of that experience. Um, and at the, again, a, a different age group again, um, we do a lot of um, post-16 work um, with special educational needs groups from Queen Mary's College, from Beecot and from Dove House. We work with them on careers advice, employability skills, um, presentation, uh, interview skills. Um, and since reopening in September, uh, we've also introduced um, longer um, term, half, half term long um, individual work placements where um, people will come in and uh, work alongside us um, and gain experience that way, which often is, is very difficult for them to get elsewhere. Uh, and then um, finally, the musication station, which is something which um, um, has been running now for, for several years, which it takes place in, in a variety of settings. We've done it in empty units in Festival Place, uh, at the Sports Centre, in the Haymarket foyers, at the Tea Bar, um, in Basingstoke Festival. Um, we're going to the Festival of Sound next week. We're also very pleased to be going to, taking it to Whitchurch over the summer um, for part of their events, uh, their Jubilee event and, and the Summer Family Festival. Um, and this is uh, where it allows people of all ages um, to experience picking up and playing a range of musical instruments. Uh, there are tu tutors on hand to show them, you know, how, how to do this. Um, and we then signpost them to local tu uh, in more advanced instrumental tuition. Um, and we know from reaction that uh, there are people who have um, who have taken this up, taken it further after coming to the musication station and now learning instruments as a, as a result of that. Um, the great thing about it is that it's one of those things that, that you can come across almost by accident uh, and um, you know have a, a completely unexpected experience that um, can be um, very enjoyable. Um, the, in terms of uh, the stages, the Haymarket and the Anvil, um, we're obviously really pleased that we have more than 30,000 local children every year performing on the stages, whether that's in the Basingstoke Area Youth Orchestra, County Youth Orchestras and Youth Bands, individual schools such as Bramley School and Sherfield School, the Gang Show and so on. Um, and this is something that happens year upon year. And 
in terms of the local ecosystem, we work closely with other, other local companies, um, including Proteus, um, whose new production of the, of the Bloody Chamber is coming to the Haymarket next month, um, with Carla the Arts, who had a very uh, successful and enjoyable Diwali event um, in the Forge, and we're looking at them for uh, using the Forge for rehearsal space. Um, with Fluid Motion, um, who uh, the, their recovery fest event for teachers was in the Haymarket last week, um, and also with the, the Hampshire Cultural Trust, where we're exploring with them possible connections between uh, the Haymarket and the Woolwich Museum. So that's just a, a very brief and I hope not too long snapshot of, of that aspect of what we do. Um, very, very conscious of time, Chair, so we'll, we'll, we will press on. Um, the, the next E in our day, um, it's not a sentence that's used very often, uh, is uh, to do with our role and uh, the economy of the sector. Um, culture, the cultural sector is big business, and today I, I did me Google, and uh, interestingly, the Treasury and the Arts Council have very different views on what the cultural sector is worth, so I've gone with the higher one. Um, but the cultural sector is a business worth roughly just under 11 billion pounds to the UK, um, 2.8 billion of that apparently goes to the Treasury, three to 400,000 jobs, close to 400,000 jobs are created, uh, and it's believed to generate up to 23 billion pounds to additional sectors, particularly across um, leisure and retail. So it, this, is a, this is a huge industry that we are part of. Um, but of course, it's, it contributes so much to other areas of the um, sector of the town. It's all about profile. It's all about regeneration. It's all about engagement. Um, and one of the challenges we have is, is as Matthew says, the programme we've largely just described um, doesn't receive any direct funding, so it has to be generated um, through the other work that we do. And Matthew, in a second, will just fly through some of those sorts of figures to give you a sense that actually the Anvil Trust is a business. The Anvil Trust does require... Uh, has required public funding and obviously in the last 12 months and through the um, pandemic there's been a significant hit on our entire sector's funding and we have ideas and ways forward and how we will actually try and fill fill those um, coffers that have, have been affected by change so it's really important i think for everyone to understand that the role of culture isn't just about putting on shows and putting on fantastic workshops it's about supporting the economy it's about creating jobs uh, it, it's an industry and it's really important to the whole shape and form of towns like Basingstoke and Dean and cities around the world. Matthew will give us some, some detail on some of those figures. Thank you. So just quickly, um, we sell in, in, a, in a typical year 170,000 tickets every year. 50% of these roughly are to Basingstoke residents and uh, people come from every ward in the borough. Um, to, to the Anvil in the Haymarket. Um, we generate uh, more than six pounds in the local economy for every one pound of public investment, whether that's the borough, the Arts Council, or other public investment. Um, and it was calculated that we support 120 local jobs in addition to our own staff. Um, the fact that we are in the Arts Council national portfolio um, and we're the only um, music client, National Portfolio Music Client in Hampshire, um, allows us through partnership working with other uh, organisations in that portfolio to bring in, a, uh, to bring in about uh, one million pounds of additional Arts Council investment into Basingstoke um, for, the, for the benefit of, of residents. Um, we generate more than 70% of our income through our own activities, um, which, you know, audiences, performers, crew, use town centre restaurants, they come to the cafes, they go into the pubs, they shop, they stay in hotels, they park in the car parks night after night supporting local businesses and the daytime and nighttime economy. This is a significant, um, a significant uh, amount of activity um, that uh, happens because of the trust being in Basingstoke. I think the other key point that I'm really keen to make around the importance of the economy is there is a reality that we are facing as a nation that our town centres have changed. Retail has changed beyond all recognition. Towns like Basingstoke and many others are going to have a higher residential um, level of involvement in the town centres. 
and there's a part that we have to play in making Basingstoke a place where you will live, you will work, and you will play. And I think as towns change, organisations like the Trust are very important. And I think, again, the investment made over the years by this town are now going to reap a huge reward because in our sector, there are towns all over the country desperate for what this, what we have and what we will use and how we will deploy it in, in, in this, uh, the regeneration of this town. Again, conscious of time. <laughs> Uh, just one last thing, and we can probably fly through this. I think it's the other end. I think it's really important, to, again, to what we do and how well we do it. It's simply excellence. We do the very best job that we can, and we work with some great people. Um, and it's really important that that is at the centre of what we do, excellence both locally, nationally, and internationally. Yes, there's the, not much. In terms of that, we, we look at it uh, as a whole. So it's it's excellence in, in the programme. We try and get the best performances that are available on tour. Um, we uh, prioritise the customer experience. Uh, the, la the last survey, um, we had 95% of, of people booking thought that the quality of the programme was good or very good, and 95% enjoyed the whole experience of coming to a performance. That obviously starts the moment they engage with us booking tickets uh, goes right through their experience in the in the day or the evening um, and ends only when they leave the car park and they will very much um, you know uh, contact us if the lifts aren't working the car park is there's a queue coming out of the car park as well as the things that that we directly have control over um, and you know we need to be alert to how those needs of customers are changing um, so certainly that's been accelerated. Some of those trends have been accelerated by the pandemic. It's now very much e-tickets rather than printed tickets. Um, we've developed a, a, a pre-order and drinks platform so that people can order uh, on the internet before they arrive in the building, which takes the pressure off the, the traditional interval scramble. Um, and the, the amount of people now booking online means that actually the traditional 10 till 6, Monday to Saturday box office counter hours and are no longer required. Um, so we need to keep uh, uh, very much aware of those changing trends as well. Um, our customers are also backstage, of course. It's, it's making sure that artists and, and crew, um, visiting artists and crew, go away with a good impression of Basingstoke, a good impression of, of the Anvil, uh, because everybody talks to each other. So if they have a, a good experience with us, uh, it, it, it will certainly um, uh, aid our, our profile in Basingstoke's profile in, in the industry. Um, and that whole excellence of reputation um, is something which um, we take very seriously and can, can only be good for Basingstoke, I think, if, if, if uh, there's, it's known that there is a, um, you know, often the reputation of Basingstoke is, is uh, less than complimentary in some respects um, and people are uh, and so it's very good that there is um, an organization and, and, a, and a, uh, you know venues like the Anvil and the Haymarket to uh, be a, a counter to some of those uh, ill-informed opinions. So finally, <laughs> yeah, because I'm, I've trained in the theatre so I have to have the full circle in the story. Um, I'd just like to come back to I came to Basingstoke with my family and really I'm the case study. We moved here because of what it had to offer and we engaged in what it had to offer. Uh, and I brought up three children here and I think there are generations, my own children possibly, who should be allowed to follow the same path. And I hope you see that what the Anvil Trust is about, what the whole cultural ecosystem is about, is worth retaining because actually it's at the very heart of this community. Thank you. Thank you very much, both of you. That was very informative. Um, so if I might um, ask committee, for the simplicity of the minutes, if we could start asking questions first and then move on to comments later. Um, and as I'm a bit new, um, Councillor Mackay is going to help. Um, but please could you try and make sure you do make eye contact with me, um, otherwise I might miss your hand and I, that's not my aim for this evening. <laughs> so does anyone have any questions? Councillor Mahaffey. Thank you, Chair. Chris, uh, Matthew, thank you very much for that. For that. that was interesting. And uh, also congratulations for the work you do because uh, I do think it is fantastic and it really does add to Basingstoke and the, the value of Basingstoke. But my, my question, as, as most of my questions are, revolve around my kids. 
Um, I've got a, a 14 year old who is um, now getting, <coughs> pardon me, getting very enthusiastic about uh, performing on stage at school. Uh, she's been a bit musical in the past. She's now sort of into her acting. And I keep asking her, do you want to go into the theatre? And of course, being 14, her vision of the theatre is um, something she gets from TikTok that, you know, the only route is I've got to be a Hollywood actress and uh, work in Marvel movies. And I keep trying to say to her, there is a vast industry around uh, the cultural, uh, around you know, the, the, the arts uh, that is not just acting. <clears throat> and so my question is, how do we as a council um, promote the industry rather than the performances themselves and I'm talking about the sound engineers the light engineers the producers the directors because for kids I don't think that's that's kind of invisible and 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 I don't think they or certainly my, my 14 year old doesn't aspire to that and I think it would be a wonderful place to 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 live your career surrounded by creative people given that I don't think she's ever going to act in a Marvel movie um, that's a really good point, actually, and I think it is it is an area that is often, as you say, with the with the sort of power of social media and everything, is is completely overlooked. Um, and um, you know, one of the ways, and this is something which we're we're now that that schools are sort of more back on an even even keel. I think is I, there are two ways, isn't there? There's there's bringing people to see not just the performances but what goes on backstage as well. Mm -hmm and going into schools and talking to them and showing them and giving them advice or uh, ideas about careers. And both of those things are something which uh, we do to a certain extent already and we definitely want to do more of. I, I would also say I have, I have that daughter, or have that daughter. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> um, I, I had that daughter and actually she did a work experience at the Anvil um, when she was in, in the 40th, 50th, whatever it's now called. Uh, and again, that was a fantastic experience for her, and she learned a lot from that, despite her father saying, don't go into the arts. Councillor McCormick. Thank you, Chair. So, um, yeah, that was a, uh, congratulations on a, a really good presentation. Um, I've got a couple of questions. Uh, the, the first is, um, how, how much is the grant cut impacted you because there was a lot of um, protests about it a couple of years ago. Uh, the second question I have is how do you see um, yourselves helping drive the recovery that we got post pandemic because one of the key things is trying to get people in the top of town in the evening and the hay market is really key to that. There's a lot of things in the top of town that would be busier. Um, if the hay market um, had a, a full um, program, uh, it's got a very good program, but obviously the more nights that it's open, the, the more people are going to come in, the more nights people are going to come in and they want meals and things before the, um, the theatre. And the hay market presents a really good opportunity at the top of town. The anvil, when you look at what there is to eat down the other end of town, I think there's... Um, cost of coffee which shuts fairly early in the evening um, German Doner Kebab House and KFC doesn't sit well with, with theatre but uh, perhaps there's something we can do as a borough if, if, if there's things that are missing down that end of town and I'm, I'm all ears as to what those might be um, I mean interestingly I mean it's a good question <laughs> Uh, one, one we've um, done a lot of thinking about, and, and the two, the two issues are actually related. So, how um, the, the, the cut happened, um, it, it, I think, is it's evidence of how well organised and how well run the Anvil has been over the last thirty years that it survived those cuts as well as it has. But that's not to say it hasn't created problems. But part of our recovery plan and part of our business plan is actually all about um, making better use of the facilities that we have, and very specifically. <laughs> Um, the hay market is a focus for us to, and with the anvil as well, to create it so it's open all day. Uh, my 87-year-old next-door neighbour who was a teacher in the town told me how she used to come in and she and her colleagues would come and they'd sit in the, in the hay market and drink coffee and have meetings. And it's that kind of culture that we need to um, get back into the town centre. Uh, we, the same with the anvil, and this relates to the ecosystem of the town. 
in that we see the hay market and the amble during the day being a focus for the arts of the world where communities can come together, but also buy very expensive coffee um, and enjoy the sorts of facilities that we will have on offer and still do have on offer. We're talking to the Cultural Trust, as Matthew said, because we see that personally, we, we see that link up between the Haymarket and the Willis Museum and the square and the top of the town as one of the most exciting opportunities the town has. Uh, and I think you're absolutely right that um, we need to be central to that. Part of our new business plan, which the council have, have um, signed off, I think, um, is about um, how the program will change at the Haymarket, how there'll be more program, how it will focus on the under 30s, how the um, bar and cafe facilities will be extended um, and there is a, one of the pictures that's kind of rotating round is a piece of work we did for the anvil on the area outside the anvil and how we can develop that for both events but also I mean, you, kebabs is probably a bad example but for food trucks food trucks is very much part of the, the culture now to create an environment around the anvil for weekends for weeks where you eat um, you socialize you see shows so really um, the, the opportunity that both the pandemic and the reduction in funding or investment gave us has been to really look and think again and say, OK, how can we do more with what we've got? And what we've discovered is we've got a lot. And actually, it's, it's now up to us to, to make the most of that and generate more income for the trust. And I actually believe, doing what I've just described, it's, it's, it's not nothing simple, but actually it's a realistic target for us to set ourselves. I don't know if I've missed anything out there. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I've got Councillor Jeans, then Councillor Carruthers, then Councillor Mama Mullaney. Um, uh, so and one more. Uh, so uh, if you if you think you've waved at me, you're going to need to wave again if you're not on my list. Councillor Jeans. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I just have a couple of questions. The first one is around collaboration, really, and and how do we create cohesion and better utilise the assets of all arts organisations in, in the borough to, you know, to, to really um, bring together all of, all of the assets that, that we have here um, to better serve the community. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a regular in, uh, in your building, so, you know, it's, it's very important to me. And my second question is regarding the levelling up. Um, I know that Basingstoke isn't one of the 109 areas on the levelling up plan it, do you think that will hugely impact you um, and how, how can you how can you sort of minimize the the damage I guess from that thank you I, I think um, the easier question is the first one <laughs> uh, the key to everything is communication and I think some of the communication channels over the years have, have fractured um, so a lot of what we're focusing on is um, improving the communication and really you know saying to the local cultural community that th these are your facilities these, these aren't ours these aren't yours these are everybody's and uh, part of the thinking behind being open for 12 hours a day etc is to bring people together to give people access to resources um, i was privileged to go to a meeting in my first month as chair of all the local cultural communities um, the relationship with the amateur groups is, is very strong of course there are always challenges in that because expectations vary hugely but again it's it's about um having the good having communication there's a conversation about having local cultural and the amateur groups represented on the trust so again those views are expressed and everyone is getting that access so the core of it is is communication um that's not to say it was bad before but it wasn't as good as it could have been is, is, is what i would actually say um but yeah the leveling up agenda that's i don't i don't really know how to answer that because i'm not entirely sure what it means <laughs> i don't mean the question i mean i mean the actual what the, what the leveling up agenda will mean for our sector um like, like I said in, when I was talking earlier, a, a lot of what we have in this town is the sort of things that parts of the town, people I know, are, are aspiring to and in areas that are about levelling up. They don't have the facilities that we already have. So we are already in a very good position. Um, as an organisation, yes, we have to look at what this means politically and financially. And I don't think it's a problem for us as long as we have the funding and the support and the investment support to actually make our facilities open to more and more people and, and a lot of what Matthew and I talked about presenting today was actually making everyone aware 
a lot, a lot of what we do is very accessible um, and uh, is already engaging with all sectors of the community and our challenge and uh, our obligation is to is to do more of that and do it better I think I don't I don't know if that answers the question but that's how I understand the concept again I don't know if you no, I would just say that the um, the pandemic has actually uh, acted to accelerate um, the sort of partnership working um, between all different areas in the town including all the cultural organizations um, in my view and um, you know, we need to take full full advantage of that for the good of the, the whole community. Thank you, Councillor Carruthers. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, really insightful. Uh, you talk about community engagement, and you particularly you talked about this world at large, which sounds amazing, um, which you go into schools and do. Um, you say it said I think that you do one year group for a week. Um, I'm I'm not sure how often you do that, but I just was interested to know as my first question how you choose the school. Um, I work in education, and I know that unfortunately we do have a lot of children in our borough who don't access um, much culture at all, if any. Um, so it'd be really interesting to know how you're choosing that school, and if perhaps you are trying to reach those children. Um, and another question um, Councillor Mahaffey asked earlier about, mentioned about his daughter and that experience. Something my own children have been involved in is the Mayor's Variety Performance where lots of schools come, which is a fantastic experience um, because actually they spend the whole day at the anvil rehearsing and preparing. They get to see behind the scenes, which is brilliant. So I just wondered, you know, is that coming back? Because I don't think we've seen one of those for a while, have we? Um, and also, um, just a brief comment to say I was really pleased to hear you mentioning your engagement with um, Hadley, you mentioned Bishopswood School, you mentioned um, the care home. Um, brilliant, because it's so important that you are coming out and engaging with those areas that are outside of the town centre, because um, there are lots of people in those areas that, that aren't able to, for, for lots of reasons, come out back into the town. So thank you. Um, yeah, absolutely, very much so. We see our, our immediate area as, as covering the whole borough, not just the town centre. Um, uh, and um, in terms of uh, how the schools get chosen, it's a mix of um, uh, them approaching us and us approaching them, if you like, and, and um, engaging with um, the right teachers or the heads uh, and um, the school being in the um, position to be able to accommodate that project. Um, so uh, you know, our community engagement uh, manager has has contacts in in pretty much all the schools, and there are there are different you know different projects that are suitable at different stages. Um, but we do uh, usually we do um, world at large at least twice a year, um, sometimes every term. Um, and then just on the, the point about the mayor's variety show, I think that is due to come back in October. I think it's an autumn autumn event. Excellent, thank you. Councillor Mama Maloney. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I recognise a couple of your acts this year, and dare I say, even the Grand Thorpe Colliery Band, which uh, I suspect many of us haven't heard of. But uh, could you just clarify, insofar as the anvil, is it big enough and is it on the circuit for national acts? Because if you look into some of the review sections and you see that the headline performers, and there are traditional towns that they go to, is the anvil and therefore basing state on that list because it's deemed big enough and suitable because picking up the point that Councillor McCormack made if there is an improvement in take up of, of uh, attendance then that has a spin-off peripheral benefit to obviously the economy certainly in the immediate vicinity um, the anvil has a maximum of 1400 seats more typically it's um, 1150 seats um, and that puts us at um, the level in between stadiums um, and venues of, sort of two and a half, three thousand. Um, what we are finding, though, is so so there are a huge number of, of national performers who who do come to the Anvil regularly. Um, uh, what we're also finding is that quite often we're able to pick up 
um, performances by people who are by artists and bands who are almost at, at a level beyond their capacity um, uh, because we can uh, offer the um, anvil for, as production um, general you know uh, pre tour um, production days Lovely. So I've got three more questions. And then if I may, um, members, I'll try and move us on to some comments. Um, so Councillor Moran Malin. Thank you, Chair. And thank you, Chris and Matthew, for your excellent report. Uh, my questions are uh, a little bit financial one here. Uh, question is about, yeah, you mentioned every pound that BDBC is spending it. We are getting a business around nine pounds. But I would like to know, Every seat that you are selling it, how much uh, BDBC is subsidizing that seat? And with reference to other places in the Hampshire, where or will? That is my first question. And the second question is, again, it's a financial one. When can we expect and will it self-sufficient financially according to your business plans? Thank you, Chair. Sadly, not long. <laughs> I, well, I mean, Matt, in terms of the actual detail of the question, the first question, um, I don't know if we have. Do we have it down to that granular level? No, I mean, uh, it's interesting. I take a very different view in terms of engagement. And we, I, I'm not avoiding your question, by the way. But I see it the other way around, that every, every um, empty seat is a waste of a sum of money with the tickets is a waste of 30 pounds so actually we should if we can't fill the seats with people buying tickets we should put out the people in those seats who can't afford to go and can't but that's a whole different agenda in, in terms of that kind of granular level of analysis of our figures i, I don't think i can sit here in all honesty and tell you give you an answer but i think we can get that information for you um i think it's a very good it's a very good question and there are so many variables in all of that um in terms of different uh, shows will come to different price, different artists, the deals with every artist is different. So there isn't, we could probably do an average figure for you, but it's quite, it's quite a big question. But I think that's definitely one our team would want to answer. Pause to look at Matthew. Yes. <laughs> now, in, in terms of the other question, um, again, that's a huge, huge question. And one we haven't actually been asked before. So our business plan is not based on getting to a um, non um, invest no investment from external funders like the council um, there are several different models for running venues and one of those models is an entirely commercial venue my honest opinion is that running a venue really this talks under the, the question of council pollen uh, pollen sorry uh, answer it, um, running a commercial venue on the size of the anvil is incredibly difficult and what you might gain in income uh, you would lose in quality and you would lose in variety and would, you would lose in terms of the, the outreach and community budget. It's a very, very different thing. Um, we, we haven't been asked to explore that, um, though I know that those conversations have taken place and presumably are taking place. Um, what I would um, really, really ask is that when those conversations take place, we're part of the conversation because the people in the room that know the most probably about running venues and running them commercially or otherwise are, is the Anvil Trust and I think it's we have a contribution to make and personally my I'm investing my time and my energy in um, the best possible cultural uh, pro offering for, for the town and um, if, if, if if I can help as a, as a you know as a volunteer as an individual for the council to get to the best possible offering for the town that meets, meets both commercial or financial concerns, but also the importance of cultural access, diversity. I'm happy to make that contribution, but I think what you've asked is a massive question, and I'd love to be part of finding the answer. I didn't answer the question, though, did I? <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Compton Burnett. Thank you, Chair. Um, First of all, thank you very much indeed for your presentation. Um, it was fascinating and it was really exciting as well to hear of all the work that you're doing. Um, I had two quick questions. The first one is that um, it's great to hear that you're going into schools, you're also drawing on our history. And one thing that um, I've noticed is that um, when I was doing my A-levels and, and university, 
um, you know, we'd do Shakespeare and we'd go to Stratford-on-Avon and we'd have a sort of immersive experience. We've got Jane Austen, and I'm wondering what we're doing about that, whether we're doing a sort of a day of Jane Austen that we can get A-level students, you know, people from all over the world, because so, so many people study Jane Austen. Um, and that could be a real draw for him. No one else has got Jane Austen in the way that we have, and we've got all the heritage around the churches and everything else. The other question is about dance. Um, you've done so many amazing things, and dance may well be one of them. I know that the ballet comes. Um, but so far as I can tell, I've got two teenage daughters. Dance is exploding, all sorts of types of dance. And the, the difference in performing in a studio versus an incredible setting um, that you have, it's, it's completely different. And I'm wondering whether we're giving younger um, boys and girls the opportunity to come out of their school where maybe they're doing uh, GCSEs, A-levels, um, or maybe just for fun, and get onto that massive stage and bring their parents along and have the lighting and the, ma and the music. <laughs> um, to answer the second question first, uh, yes, there are an enormous number of uh, local dance schools who do perform at both the Haymarket and the Anvil every year, um, and you know we're thrilled to, to welcome them to, to do that. Um, and as you say, we also um, have dance in our program um, in order to uh, show them, you know, other other professional professional uh, companies. Um, working in the same area um, and in terms of Jane Austen um, yes that's that sounds to me like something where um, the cultural ecosystem could very well make a good contribution and I think we should talk further about it thank you councillor Follett Maitland hello there thank you chair um, first of all I'd like to say how delighted we are to bring the music Haitian station to Whitchurch later this year um, but I'd also really like to um, reiterate the point here this evening that you are an Arts Council NPO. I don't quite know whether people realise the significance of that in terms of income stream. All the points that we've heard here in terms of high quality arts provision, intergenerational nature and community outreach, they form the basic themes of um, the uh, let's create strategy for the next 10 years. In other words, if we hit those tick boxes, it helps us get that external funding and it takes the pressure off the council to um, subsidise or put um, further funding in. So the point I'm trying to make is um, all of these points are really important, not as nice to haves, but they are an essential part of um, creating an income um, and that leads into a question we've talked here about leveling up and how hard that is because uh, according to all the reports we're already leveled up but I wonder if there's um, a way to access further funding or allocated pots by going after some of the half funding um, so for example if one of the um, uh, themes in uh, the Let's Create strategy is um, focused on children and young people. Whether it's possible to coordinate, however difficult and challenging that might be, for example, with Hampshire County Council and their children's services, because don't forget they will be allocating the government half funding, holiday activities and food. They will have all of these contacts with all the different childcare providers around the borough who are absolutely keen on getting hold of high quality arts practitioners and it's a great way to get freelancers or the musication station out to all these rural wards and uh, schools across the borough so it, it hits so many tick boxes but it gives us an alternative revenue stream because I, I think frankly at the moment particularly for the arts it's that's the name of that's the name of the game it's trying to find the cash it's a it's a really really challenging environment thank you and i think that's a fantastic point and um you know th this is something where whether it's have funding whether it's social prescribing um whether it's you know any other sort of um uh different income streams or different 
their income streams because they're also ways of looking at service to the community. Um, but I think, uh, again, coordination of, of all of these sorts of things is, is the key here. We would be really keen to take part in any kind of uh, work in order to try and secure some of, uh, some of that income and certainly to um, work with the, the county and the borough councils in order to make those sorts of um, ideas a reality. It's also about, it comes back to the ecosystem thing, where us working with other cultural organisations in the town, in the district, about creating, I know about the funding system a bit as well, and if, if the applications are coming from multiple groups, that's a huge plus again as well. So that's another strand that we're working on, and I think is the way forward. Exactly. So I think those funding comments should probably be included in the minutes as um, from the committee, if other members are agreed with that. Yeah. Um, does anyone else have any comments to make? Councillor McCormick. Well, I, one of the things, um, I, I noticed that down in Borden, the Phoenix Theatre have carved out a, a really good niche as a prototyping venue for national um, events where you're talking about the two and a half, three thousand seaters. Um, I'm just wondering whether that's something that's um, on the radar of Anvil Arts because you've got the Forge and you've got the Haymarket um, which could potentially be really good um, venues sort of dry run venues for, for national shows when they're putting these things together they don't want to um, take risks with larger audiences but an audience of 100 or 300 would get a very good feel of what that show would look like on the road when it's going to places like um, the Hammersmith Apollo or the O2 or some of these bigger bigger venues. Um, I think there's a lot that we can look to do as a council as well. We need to build a, a good offer in terms of how these venues are being used during the day and how they're being used in the evening and the wider nighttime economy because our nighttime economy has taken a big hit over the last 20 years. It was really vibrant 20 years ago. Now it's not. There are various reasons for that. People are, have less disposable income um, thanks to 12 years of austerity for one. Um, rising costs of living and um, wages being squeezed in the next couple of years are going to look really tough. But I think we ignore the arts at our peril and I think it's, um, it's a very short-sighted decision to start restricting um, things like grants and talk about when venues can break even because it's about quality of offer, it's not about a, you know, a pure commercial basis. Um, I, I think we, we would miss out if, if we d decided that we were only interested in venues that uh, stand on their own two feet. Um, and one of the things I would like to see, which is complementary to what, what the Anvil Trust offers, is more um, local live music and, and offering of venues that way. Um, potentially we have um, lots of pubs and, and community halls and things that could be used for that. Thank you, Councillor McCormick. I think some of that should actually come into our next item, which is the cultural framework and statement of intent for culture. So last call for any short, please, comments on the Anvil Arts. No, perfect. Thank you very much, gentlemen. It's been a real pleasure to have you here this evening. Councillor Bean, would you like to um, introduce the next item for us? Yes, thank you, and apologies for the cough. I have a bit of a cold at the moment. Um, so yes, uh, culture plays a really important part in making our borough a great place to live, work and invest in. We um, know having a vibrant culture offer plays a really important role in enhancing the quality of our residents' lives and has a positive effect on well-being. I think it's really important to say that culture also means many different things to many different people, so by its very nature can be very broad. Um, tonight we're seeking your views on the ambitions, objectives and focus of the cultural framework and statement of intent, as well as the establishment of a cultural compact and its possible membership and role. 
Our current cultural strategy was adopted in 2017 and reflected priorities and the current local context at that time. Since adoption, there have been many changes which have res resulted in a review and the bringing forward of this new cultural framework. The framework identifies three core themes that will act as a guiding principle to place culture at the heart of what makes Basingstoke a great place. And I think it's really important as we move forward, particularly um, that one of the council's keys, key roles is in around enabling and empowering our local communities, businesses and residents to lead on and shape the delivery of culture in the future. Due to the pandemic, I think we have also seen a significant shift in the way in which people might access culture. And I think this is a great opportunity to continue to build upon the successes around a more digitised culture offering as well. We believe that the introduction of a cultural compact can play a pivotal role in further enhancing the cultural offer in Basingstoke. Cultural compacts can help places improve dialogue and partnership working, lever funding and benefit the local and wider cultural ecology. A compact is not a one size fits all model, but shaped by each place and the council will need to be actively involved in the establishment of and running of the cultural compact and will have an important role to play in fostering connections between the various member organisations and ensuring strong linkages to local priorities and agendas. Thank you and I think I'm going to hand over to Daniel now. Thank you Councillor Lubin. Um, <laughs> conscious of time so our intention with us and that is not actually to say very much but very much kind of more of a kind of a conversation with you and kind of get your views on the on the framework and statement of intent. Um, but first of all I would like to say that this is very much a first draft so this is not a finished article at all. Um, tonight actually is our first kind of sort of outing I would say of the um, of the cultural framework or formal outing of the cultural framework. We've kind of done some informal engagements with some arts organisations already. So you know getting your views on the approach will be really important as we move forward and as we kind of <coughs> sorry develop further iterations of the of the framework before its adoption. Um, the framework, as Councillor Bean said, I think you know we had the cultural strategy. I think we felt it was kind of you know opportune now to to review it and and kind of look at the approach overall. Um, and to help us with this, we commissioned counterculture, a specialist sort of arts and culture consultant, to do some research for us, to do some engagement for us. Um, they spoke with quite a lot of kind of local stakeholders from the arts, but also from other sectors like health and community and so forth, um, to help us identify you know, our strengths, you know, what is good about Beijing Stoke and Guinness culture, what, you know, where are the gaps, um, but also you know, where are the, the challenges and opportunities. Um, as Councillor Bean said, you know, defining culture can be challenging because culture means different things to different people. Um, the way we've looked at it this time around um, was very much about, about living and about living in Basin Second Bean and looking at culture as basically taking time out of what you normally do uh, and a way of enjoying yourself, discovering new experiences, having some new, new experiences. Um, I mean, our approach in the past had tended to be very focused on, on culture, meaning the arts. And I think, you know, but this time on the way, came to look at culture in its broader sense. Um, with the statement of intent and, and the framework, we very much want the culture to be a catalyst within the conduit to help us also address and deliver, I guess, our many other priorities like health and well-being, climate change, town centre regeneration, economic development, community cohesion, and, and so forth. Um, and at the heart of this, we feel that collaboration and partnership will be key. And I think, you know, sort of, uh, um, Anne Villas may talk about collaboration. It's really important that we get cultural organisations to work together, but not just cultural organisations, also bring in other partners like health and economy and business and community, so that, you know, collectively they can look at, you know, what are the linkages, basically, between culture and the rest? What are the opportunities? Um, and also kind of work together to, to co-create and co-design um, interventions that would ultimately enhance culture for locally. Um, and I think, you know, the cultural compact, we very much intend to have a cross-sector, you know, uh, representation as part of that, to ensure, you know, that awareness of other agendas, other parties, and I think you know, your question, Councillor, I think it was quite interesting, because yes, you know, culture could also help us, you know, supporting, you know, <laughs> school clubs and that sort of things, and then, then bring education, bringing help, you know, help us kind of understand, have a better picture of that kind of wider local agenda. That's all I say. I'll let Ross, you know, tell you a bit more about, you know, kind of the, the statement of intent and, and the priorities and then open the rest for, uh, for questions and comments. Thank you, committee. Um, so the statement of, atten of intent is on 2.4 of the report. Um, and I think that's really our first stab at a definition for 
for what culture means to our businesses, our residents, us as a council and all of the stakeholders that we've engaged through the counterculture work. Um, and as part of this, we've come up with three pillars. Um, experimentation. Basenstoke is a place to experiment and innovate. We really want to embrace the digital age, and that's not to say that the traditional art forms aren't important, but how do we complement them moving forward in a time when 5G is coming forward and people are really enjoying culture um, at home? Also, how do we continue to give artists a platform in Basenstoke? We have many festivals, we have many opportunities for Proteus, for example, to premiere their work in the borough, but how do we continue to drive that experimentation and how can our residents also get really involved um, in that work from a participant perspective, not just an audience member? Also, we have plenty of spaces available for culture, outdoor arts. The Basingstoke Festival really proved that there are plenty of opportunities to perform in our town centre in the most unusual spaces. And that seemed really important coming out of COVID as outdoor work seemed to be really embraced um, by residents. But also we've got a lot of parks and green spaces. Um, and this year marks um, the Queen's Jubilee and we're really hoping that communities will really embrace that opportunity to do more work in the wards directly. It's not just about our urban centres, but also rural work and Councillor Follett Maitland's already touched on her Whitchurch Festival, which was great, and then the Winter Festival. Um, so we are talking about Basingstoke and Dean here. And then in terms of experience, um, I think it's really important that we give residents and visitors to the borough an opportunity to take part in something that's new and different um, and something that, that they wouldn't perhaps normally engage in. And that really plays into our skills agenda too. But we also want our experiences to be impactful. Um, and I cite the Diwali that came through the town centre as a real opportunity to go to something different and embrace different communities. And it was quality, you know, residents really enjoyed it. The council received a significant amount of emails um, about the brilliant work that Carlo the Arts did on that project. But we also want to enable our groups to deliver and um, I think many of our organisations are very reliant on the council to help them to deliver and we want to make sure that we can enable communities and artists and arts organisations to really deliver for the borough and take part in that lifelong um, learning too. So our vehicle for delivering this is a new cultural compact. Um, that's a shared collective ambition for culture. And we've talked tonight about MPO and make sure that we safeguard some MPO funding for Basingstoke. But I think it's really important that we have a collaborative shared vision, a one voice for culture in Basingstoke to make it the real cultural center that we want it to be. Um, and that shared um, working can also share the load as well. So it's not all sitting just on the arts organisations in the room and the two MPOs, um, Shoulders and the Council Economy and Culture team. Um, and we're really hoping that that will also drive our priorities forward as well. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? I would encourage members to focus probably on the strategy document, which is the horizontal pages rather than the vertical report, because that's that's the substance of what we need to get into. Um, and if you could keep your questions short, um, that would be wonderful. Councillor Mackay. Uh, I certainly think the cultural compact idea is very interesting. Um, you say in the report that it's, uh, it's an idea that's aimed at cities. I just wondered what evidence or success from elsewhere convinced you that it was applicable um, and would translate well into, into Basingstoke and, and Borough. Um, as a second part to the question, I wonder if once we adopt, if we adopt that, how are we going to measure whether it's, it's successful? 
so that the committee sitting here in five years time looking at, a, 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 at the next step on how are we going to know that we've done the right thing and, and where the where the good things have come from uh, a final part of the question I had a, a look at the cultural compact uh, makeup for a few other towns and cities and they seem to have focused in on around uh, around 12 people or 12 organizations being involved so just a sharing a concern I suppose that we've started off with a list of 18 um, I'm just worried that it might be something if we're not careful it could become something unwieldy and, and not, not achieve what's wanted I know we're talking about strategy at the moment but at the end of the day it'll be the implementation of the strategy that residents will, will benefit from thank you I think that's a, um, a great question and they are very new um, in terms of the output um, but this is certainly something that the Arts Council England are driving forward for towns. Um, there's been an establishment of one in Rushmore, there's been one in Gosport, um, very early stages of development, but they do seem to be driving forward um, that shared collective vision and getting those, those outcomes really sort of ingrained on everyone's um, mind for how we deliver those priorities we're certainly not fixed on those 18 organizations and those those are example organizations at the moment of what who we think are the sorts of organizations that could form um, part of that I think there would also be a number of subgroups to help drive some of those themes forward um, and that may involve different members as well um, and I think certainly um, when we look at for example the cultural organisations I know that everyone will want to have a voice there um, so it's making sure that we're not excluding people um, and I think it's making sure that we're really representative in terms of the sectors of society on that um, compact and I think that's all definitely up for further discussion going forward. Sorry, just oh, sorry. Uh, no, sorry. Um, I just wanted to pick up on your point as well around um, kind of tracking outcomes, and I, I don't have the answer, but I think that's super important. That you know, if, if we set something up or instrumented in that, actually, there need to be really clear outcomes that we're able to track against. Um, so I definitely think that's an important part of this as well. And I was going to pick up on that point. I think you know we are kind of part of a, of a working group with other local authorities that have got cultural compacts. So at the moment, you know, we're doing some fact finding, some learning, and sort of understanding kind of how they're they're kind of running. And because each compact, you know, across the country is slightly different and has a different model, so we're trying kind of to pick the best, you know, overall energy <laughs> to help us with ours. And I think you know the, the the performance monitoring is very important, but we want to make sure that the members are engaged in that as well. So you know, so we, we don't you know it's not the council saying that just how we're going to measure your performance, but together you know how are we going to measure our performance? What key outcomes? What indicators do we want to have? You know to make sure that what we're doing together as a group you know has got has got impact and, and clear measurable outcomes. Lovely, Councillor Jeans. Thank you. Um, I. <laughs> I mean, from, from the reading that I've done so far, I mean, it seems that the compacts can be a very useful tool, providing that they do have a specific measurable agenda. And I think we need to be absolutely clear if, if we are focusing just on the town centre, is it the whole of Basingstoke? Um, can we make sure that it's constantly updated? and improved um, and, and really needs to focus on all of the organisations to make sure that you know we, we can we can really avoid what what we see at the minute which is a disconnect between the organisations so uh, how do you feel that uh, to enable the interface with with the boards the organisations stakeholders fund holders I mean beyond pure goodwill how, how will you get them to engage? I think it's tricky because we're talking about volunteers, essentially, you know, and, and, and particularly when we're talking about the arts organisations, they're all very lean in terms of their makeup. Um, and so I think I, I'm very mindful of that as well um, when it comes to that stakeholder engagement map, what that looks like in terms of making sure the weight... Um, is shared equally between the organisations and and let's face it the council is 
is going to have to drive this in the first instance because you know when I look at some of the organizations we're talking about one person who who's leading a cultural organization so I think it's really important that 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 we look at that and how that works going forward in terms of making sure that 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 it's a shared collective and that 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 we're engaging the right people at the right level who are making the right decisions um for the compact to move forward. Councillor Follett Maitland. Oh just I mean you know with with all partnerships really the way you know it's it's what's what's in it for me. And I think we need to make sure that you know every person on the compact, you know, has an invested interest. I think you know in the compact, but also see the benefit to them, you know, you know, from their organisation perspective. And that's why I think you know, for us, we want to look at course, you know, the, as part of the wider agenda. You know, if I'm the hospital or a health organisation, I want to use culture to benefit my outcome. So I think you know that that make sure that the, the compact, you know, has got that sort of awareness of what other people are doing, what their priorities are, you know, their challenges, and how culture might help them with that too. Also, kind of help us with getting that. That buy in basically with in the cultural compact. Thank you. Councillor Follett Maitland. Thank you, Chair. I, th I think the magic words for me um, were said by Councillor Bean, um, as in lever funding, um, because again, it's all about funding. Um, and reading through this, um, it what really uh, sprung up to me is its alignment to the new Arts Council Let's Create strategy, uh, which puts the focus on creative people and cultural communities. Um, so much of it's about place shaping and really uh, encouraging local communities to have high quality arts par participation. And this is exactly what this report is really drawing out. So, uh, guys, I think it's a fantastic effort and it's really something worthwhile to build on. Um, my, I suppose my one constructive question to ask is if there's a possibility for crossover with one of the policies in the local plan update, um, policy EP5, rural tourism, we've got that list on page uh, 30. Um, where we talk about uh, in places such as Roman Kaleva, Highclere Castle, Stratfield Stane Vine, Sandon Memorial Chapel and Whitchurch Silk Mill, which I'm really glad to see there because it's an Arts, uh, Arts Council accredited museum um, and our main tourist attraction in Whitchurch. So if you are able to put it into uh, the strategy here, it would be fantastic to see it within policy EP5 so that there's some form of crossover and emphasis on place shaping. Um, and it's a really clever way, I think, to uh, lever funding uh, because, uh, as I've said before, that's the name of the game at the moment. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. I think we'll raise it with our colleagues from planning. Sorry, Councillor Corby, I didn't see you. Sorry, no, I just <laughs> forgot you had to answer the question. That was all. I was thinking several of us were at EPH last week, so um, that does make sense indeed. Um, Councillor Sustain. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, yes, I, I welcome this. I think this is great. I think anything that um, is going to enhance what we can give to residents is always going to be a good thing. Um, one of the things I kind of slightly concerned about really is more it's more sort of the tone as the fact that this seems to come very much from a directive and potentially almost sounds slightly prescriptive I don't mean to sound critical but the idea of culture comes from um, who we are and we talk about residents and keeping residents in our communities in Basingstoke at the heart of the compact and when we look at the grouping obviously I also agree with Councillor Lynch, Councillor Mackay said about the numbers of people um, but it does seem to be very heavy on people at the top who are more directed and this idea of leadership. And I'm thinking more um, culture needs to be something more about facilitating and potentially about being an enabler um, and putting it out from people that live in Basingstoke. So you really hit what people want. Um, and I think this sort of direction just, you know, and it's also, I think there is a chance then of being a bit bolder and a bit braver. So I think we do have a tendency in Basingstoke to be a little bit um, nervous about um, doing sort of quite dramatic things. And this whole thing is around looking at how we can shape our place and our future. There's another thing as well that I feel has failed to come through, and it actually goes back to a comment made um, by Councillor Compton-Burnett in the previous 
um, talk around Jane Austen, for example. And it's actually about our history and our heritage. And that doesn't really come out in this compact. So I know it's all, this is all about being creative, taking things forward and building something exciting and new. But we also need to think about where we come from. And culture, as far as, obviously you have cultural um, capital individually, but within a place I'd say Basingstoke has a lot of its own cultural capital, which, you know, focusing around the sort of whole engineering, around um, obviously some of the art stuff. There is a lot that makes what Basingstoke is its actual own person, its own entity, its own presence. Put it, if I'm trying to get the words right on it, but that's something that I felt, and I thought that would be, it would be really nice to see that reflected in this, would actually, I think, would enhance this and make it a lot stronger. Thank you. I don't think you know, that there's an answer, but thank you very much for your comments, and definitely we'll take them on board. Thank you. I will sneak in a quick question of my own before going to Councillor Murphy. Um, so I do really like it. My only query is where the name Time Out came from, because perhaps I've watched too much Super Nanny, but to me it feels like we're putting our cultural organisations on the naughty step. <laughs> it, it's a working title. Um, Ross and I, you know, we're saying, you know, what we don't want to put it like it's just, you know, a cultural framework, you know, we need to give it a name. And it kind of, we thought, you know, it's just about living, you know, called what you do in your spare time. But spare time has kind of a negative connotation. And, and for me, you know, when I think of time out, actually, I think of taking time out of, you know, what I normally do and kind of and, and chill out and relax. You know, obviously, you know, there's reference to the, uh, the famous magazine in London, Time Out in Barcelona and so forth. So I think, you know, but very much a working title. And if you've got ideas, you know, for a different title, please, please do, do let us know. Challenge has been set, committee. Councillor Mahaffey. Thanks, Chair. Um, you've identified here that um, there is a gap in our cultural provision for 13 to 25 year olds. That's something I feel very um, close to home, having two teenage uh, girls at home. Now, I remember when I was 15, 16, 17, we used to spend our times lying about our age, trying to get into pubs, trying to get into venues where we could have a drink and go and see a band. Um, quite rightly, that is now far more difficult uh, than it was in my day. Um, but I just went through the um, just went through the anvil. Uh, what's on? Uh, given our previous speakers, and I, I love my girls going out to, to bands or whatever, and they desperately want to. But looking at the list we've got here, we've got they're all sort of mostly tribute bands. We've got the Bootleg Beatles, Robert Cray Band, Little Mix Tribute, China Crisis Tribute, Queen Tribute, Go West, Paul Young, Diana Ross. Everly Brothers, Toya, Hazel O'Connor, Steve Harley. Brilliant names for my age, but I'm staring 60 square in the face. There's absolutely nothing on there that is targeted at that, that age group. So, you know, the answer is what do, we, what do we do? You know, where can, we, where can I send the girls for a good night out that's safe and, and you know, they're not going to get in trouble? Um, so anyway, that's, yeah, I don't know what the answer is. I think it's interesting in terms of nighttime economy and the 13 to 25 year olds interlinked really um, and we have seen you know the death of of bars that that have the ability to have a live gig music venue um, but what I would say in in defense of the anvil was a uh, drag race last week was attended by a number of 13 to 25 year olds. In fact, I think it was sold out at, at well over um, 950, trying to get the capacity right. Um, and there are there is offers in there, such as Little Mix coming up um, for that. But I do think there is something around, how do we get younger people out of X Factor on a Saturday night and into culture? Sorry, guys, that wasn't designed as a dig. I didn't realise you were still here. But, 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 but yeah, I'll talk about you behind your back. But, but the question, actually, if I may, Chair, is, is probably to you guys. Um, I appreciate we're not going to, you know, we, the best we're going to get is a little mix tribute. We're not going to get little mix here because we don't have the venues of that sort of size. But why can't we have, I mean, the, there was an example given there, so I'm, I'm probably wrong already. But why don't we have venues in Basingstoke that are targeting the up and coming youngster bands that you know I can send my kids to, and in five ten years time they're going to be you know they're, they're going to be the next um, 
sort of megastars, and they can say, oh, I can see them before they were famous. If you come forward to the public mic, um, you can answer. <laughs> um, I, I, I mean, it's, it, I, one of the things I would say is in our business plan and the document that we produced for the soft tender for the taking of the, well, retaining the license of the lease for the um, um, hay market was exactly that. So you will see a significant um, change in the target audience bringing in up and coming bands, bringing in comedians on their first part of the journey. So 100%, and uh, as you know, I've daughters that are a little bit older than yours, but same experience. So yes, that is absolutely core to the future of the Anvil Trust program. But it also connects to the question about the financial viability of the trust, and funding is at the heart of all of this, is that the tribute vans are very popular, they sell very well, people drink a lot of, of pre-ordered drinks. So it's, it's the challenge for us in any cultural organisation is actually getting that balance between teenagers and the under 30s and then generating enough commercial income to support everything else but we think we're moving very quickly in that direction because i think the comments absolutely spot on and, and ross's response is absolutely spot on but i think the documents we've already submitted to council have suggested or shown that that's our intention right. thank you so. councillor b yeah sorry just to come in on that point having two young boys myself so and i think part of the challenges as well um with the younger generation is they don't necessarily go out in the same way that we previously did. So even to try and draw them away from their Xbox, I mean, mine won't even go out to walk the dog. So, and, and I think it's not necessarily trying to reinvent something new, but it's playing to actually the things that they enjoy doing at home, but trying to maybe get them out and do that somewhere else. And I think this is where the cultural compacts can be a really helpful vehicle, because if we think of that 13 to 25 age group, actually, in terms of from a health perspective, there is a lot around mental well-being at the moment. And I just think as a vehicle, it will be really powerful in bringing some of those conversations together that actually from a health perspective says, actually, you know, we've got a growing problem in this age group. How can we use culture in its broadest term to try and help some of the, you know, the, the issues, if you like, that, that you're seeing from a health perspective? So I just think that this is where that's a great opportunity to bring conversations which might be happening in silos together into one place to have like a really meaningful impact. Mm -hmm. Councillor Compton Burnett. <laughs> Thank you. Um, just to pick up on that, um, looking through the, the compact, um, I might be missing something and they might be somewhere else, but things like groups of young people. Um, is there a young person's voice here? Um, is there a, an older person's voice? So not just organisations, but I think representatives of the people who we want to bring into the, to enjoy the culture. I think, you know, at the moment, as I said, you know, the cultural compact is very much not set in stone. It's just, you know, kind of initial list. And I think that's why tonight is very important <laughs> because that helps kind of shape, you know, kind of what, you know, people would expect to see on there. So I think, you know, kind of taking all this on board, really. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Um, so I think we've actually drawn out quite a few comments through our questions. Um, so I think the importance of outcomes was, was very clear. Uh, a potential link to policy EP5 on rural tourism in the local plan. Um, making sure that this uh, strategy is really local people centric. Um, and picking up on that last comment in, in a span of ages, so not just um, middle age, but uh, older and younger as well. Uh, making sure that our cultural strategy also celebrates our history and our heritage, um, and the importance of a 13 to 25 year old provision. Is there any other comments that people would like to add? No, in which case I might just slip in my personal plea of a music venue where you can stand and dance while listening to a band, <laughs> because I'm no longer 13 to 25, but we, I do miss that. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you very much, officers and Councillor B.
Right, I'm going to suggest we do the next paper but then have a small break. Um, so that's Strengthening Communities. Um, I'll just give Councillor Vox um, and Sam Carlton a chance to come up, do a bit of swap over. Well, a very warm welcome to Councillor Vox back to CEP um, as we swap sides of the table. Um, it's lovely to have you here. We do have a, a visiting speaker, uh, we've got a visiting member this evening, so I'll ask Councillor Vox and then the officers to do their introduction and then I'll invite Councillor James up to speak. Thank you very much, Chair, and welcome to the Chair, Rob. <laughs> um, uh, good evening, everybody. Um, I'd just like to start by thanking uh, Sam and her team very much for um, writing this paper, uh, which is fantastic in quite a short time, I think. Um, and as I think it sets out quite uh, clearly, this is very much an embryo paper um, coming to CEP uh, to get views um, as it's shaped and, and taken forward. Um, I think it's very important for us to remember that communities are, our, are the fabric of what makes the borough what it is, um, whether it's a, a, a running club, whether it's um, a community cafe, whatever it is, these groups of people who, who come together, they are what makes um, our, our places, uh, the pl sense of place where we live and we want to live here. So I think it's absolutely fundamental. So we need to get this right. Um, so I'm in lis listening mode this evening um, and I'm looking very much forward very much to hearing all your views. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor. Um, <coughs> also, Councillor Tan, I think we've heard that a few times, haven't we, really? But I just wanted to give a very brief in introduction um, to where we are now and kind of what we're seeking from you as well. Um, so the draft strategy has been developed to act as a framework really to enable further pieces of work to take place which so it's it basically to act as a bit of a hook with some guiding principles around it. So there's further work to do particularly around the way the council does work with communities um, in the future and also the approach to community and voluntary sector funding as well as our approach to community facilities going forward. Um, the focus of the strategy is very much around enabling and empowering communities to become more resilient and more self-reliant. This isn't a new approach for the Council at all. We've got a long history of working alongside communities and um, it's more about drawing together um, various different pieces of work that exist across the Council and being clear about what the direction is for those going forward as well. Um, we know that in many cases far better outcomes can be achieved through communities themselves rather than doing for and to communities. We've saw, we saw that really strongly come through in relation to the response to the pandemic where communities really stepped up um, and showed how, how much they can achieve for themselves by working you know, sort of alongside us and others um, to be able to respond to the needs that exist within their communities and what we're really keen to do is make sure that we build upon that traction that's really been gained over the years. You know, we recognise that there's been a huge impact on communities as a result of the, uh, the pandemic, but there's also been huge gains um, in terms of how communities have, uh, have um, sought to understand what's going on for them and how they can lead what happens in response to that. And also in terms of their relationships with a wide range of partner organisations who certainly seem to be far more recognising the value in working alongside communities and in enabling them to be able to lead on an awful lot of the solutions to what happens in their areas. So the main purpose of this, and this is very much um, an early draft of this strategy, is to seek your views in terms of the direction that we're proposing um, and 
this is very much the early stage in the consultation. We haven't gone through a consultation process yet, so we're coming to you first. So we would welcome your thoughts and, um, and to help shape where we go next with this. So thank you. Thank you. Councillor James, would you like to come and speak? Um, Councillor James, I think you've only got four minutes to, to speak. I'll give you a nudge about 30 seconds from the end to allow you to, to wind up on time. Thank you. Before I speak, if I could just say that I have a, comp a conflict of interest in that I'm a chair of a community centre, which is a hall for all. It's not my registered or interest, but I just wanted to make it clear in relation to this paper. Thank you. I suppose what I want to raise with you tonight, and I'm really concerned about in, in the paper, um, and and have had conversations with officers about this is on page uh, 54, 2.11, uh, well, I suppose it's 2.10 and 2.11, where you talk about maximising community facilities. And this section outlines a proposed approach to existing communities owned community buildings, as well as those that are new facilities. And within the report, you refer to there being 23 community centres and 100 uh, community uh, facilities. But the, ones, the 23 are the community centres that are owned by the borough. What I'm really concerned about, the, where it talks about exploring opportunities for asset transfer for existing council-owned facilities, I'm just concerned about, and I suppose um, many of you, uh, other people who are in these community centres are concerned about the future of community centres. Are we looking to, is this what this is saying, that we're looking to sell those community centres <coughs> off? Are, are we going to transfer the ownership of those community centres? And what will community centres look like in the future in relation to new development like Manydown or any new development that comes forward? Are we then saying that the ownership uh, of these facilities will not be owned by the borough. I think that's a loss. I think that's the wrong move to take. And I really would like to, in some more detail, talk to whoever's sort of shaping this and um, if the officers would talk to us about that, because I'm, I think this is a, a bad move. And I think we've worked really hard um, in the borough to develop these assets. And I think it would be, a, a loss if we was to lose them. So please think about that. Is this a political direction? And we heard Councillor Isa in the full council last meeting refer to the selling off of community centres um, in the rural areas. Is this what this is about, this paper? Uh, please, please think again. It, it would be very detrimental to those 23 community centres and we was to lose them. And I think they need to stay in public ownership. I think it's important that they are accountable. There is some accountability, and they they owned by the public, How, because they are our asset, and we have bought those. Thank you. Thank you. Would you like to respond to that? Yeah. Thanks very much for that. So thinking um, around the reference to exploring opportunities around asset transfer is more about where there are community, potentially secret um, organisations within the community who might be seeking to take greater responsibility for an asset. So it's more about um, having having the vehicle available. I think if, if we've got um, organisations coming forward and saying, actually, this is something we would be seeking to take on for the wider benefit of the community, rather than seeking to sell off buildings with the intention of it. So it's about an enabling tool. And that might be in some way in the, in the language in terms of how it's put. So that's something we can we can certainly look at. I'm still not sure what you mean by the asset. Is the, the asset the building? And if it is the build, if, even if a, somebody comes forward and they, they are interested in taking that on, is that something that we would want to do? I, I you know I think it's still ultimately we should, we as the borough council uh, should be as an accountable democratic process should be holding onto that building. I'm all in favour of, you know, as chair of a community centre that we have more and more, you know, control over what we're doing, but ultimately I'm still accountable 
to the borough for that building and for what we do there. And, and I think that's important that that stays. I think for that to be lost would be detrimental. And I think it's a very backward move. In, in fact, I think it's quite fearful, really. I think at the moment what, what happens is that we haven't got a policy of the council for asset transfer. So if, let's say, a community organisation comes to us, and I think, you know, when we say asset transfer, the idea is not to take over a community centre, sell it to a commercial operator. This is not, very, this is not the intention at all here. It's very much, you know, to, to have a policy in place where if a community organisation that currently occupies one of our buildings actually comes to us and say, We'd like basically to take over the asset, you know, to kind of for us to manage it and run it completely, and for you know, for us to, to, to own it. Um, you know, we haven't got a policy in place. We need to make sure that we have got a policy in place. You need to be able to deal with these cases. The intention is not to go through every community centre in the borough and say, "Here we go," you know, we don't want it anymore. Here you can have it. I think you know it will be a case by case basis, depending on the status of the organisation, where they are. I think you know in their journey and that sort of thing. So I think you know. The, Rest assured, I think you know the intention here is not to basically for us to get rid of all our community centres and, and and sell them. That's not the intention at all. Because you know we want to make sure that I think you know community organisations that manage this asset and occupy them, you know, have got a way. You know, if they want to, to be able to take ownership of the asset. Uh, if they still want to, you know, stay as a tenant, again, you know, we need to make sure that we've got a relevant policy with that. So it's not absolutely it's not. You know, there is no sort of commercial kind of sort of uh, element to it. It's very much, you know, making sure that, you know, if a community organisation, you know, actually wants to own the asset, then we are able to have a policy in place to, to look at this. Lovely. Thank you, Councillor James. Do any other members have any questions for our officers? Um, Councillor Tustain. Thank you. Actually, it's following on, really, from um, what Councillor James has just been talking about. Um, I think the, the issue here is actually in the wording, and I am actually also very concerned, because we have to say seek alternative arrangements for the ownership and management of new facilities. It doesn't say seek alternative arrangements for the potential enablement of ownership or anything like that, um, and explore opportunities for asset transfers, not to actually put something in place. So um, likewise, this, this really concerns me. Um, obviously, I'm in Popley, and we have a lot of people that use community centres. We've got some fantastic facilities. Um, there's a lot of elderly, uh, elderly re residents that get out there for coffee mornings and things. They're lovely buildings. If you start talking about having um, even well-meaning charity groups taking these over and managing them, and then things go wrong, and then the places get run down, we're at a serious risk of losing some vital assets in our communities. And I think certainly in the areas where deprivation is more of an issue um, this could be a really retrograde step and I'm very concerned about this thank you for that I think you know for us kind of looking for the other language you know how we kind of expressing that because I think you know it's not 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 the intention I think you know in terms of the policy so thank you for that Councillor McCormick thank you chair um so I think it's a bit of a mixed bag in terms of uh, community centres in and around the town, because I can think of quite a few that have disappeared over the years, um, places like the Shearer Hall, uh, the Dryden Hall, um, the Harlick Hall in Winklebury, um, and, and others that have have survived, you know, had de very dedicated people. Um, but uh, when you're looking at a committee structure, um, running a community facility, it's, it's a tough old job, and you're very much reliant on the people stepping up to do it. Um, the risk I see is the council have got a number of community assets um, and we had a paper in front of full council last month about the climate emergency and the energy efficiency of these buildings and we need to be a climate neutral council by 2025 and we're way behind on these buildings and some of the tented buildings were just taken off the balance sheet as it were, oh, we, we won't look at them. So can I have some assurance that the council's not seeking to get rid of its community facilities to other owners so that it can somehow sidestep the issue of becoming a carbon neutral council in 2025? And we're also committed to being an entire carbon neutral borough by 2030. And some of the organisations that might be buying these things would then have five years to get to know the building and do it up. You know, I'm not saying that it's um, 
an ideal situation we find ourselves in with 50 year old buildings with hideously bad heating systems and energy efficiency but as a council we do need to step up to the plate on this and I would like some reassurance that this is not the reason why we're seeking to dispose of these assets. I think if I might venture to reassure you Councillor McCormick, my understanding of the way we're approaching climate change in our buildings is that our priority and our goal for 2025 is our owned and managed buildings. We're not ignoring the other ones, um, but they are in the 2030 category. Therefore, the priority is looking at 2025. And as that phase begins to take action, then the 2030 buildings will start being looked at. Um, I don't know if officers have anything else to comment. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I'd like to reassure um, Councillor McCormick that there is no um, plan to sell these buildings off to um, meet our climate agenda. This um, this paper is in whilst everything we do is, is linked to the climate agenda. This is certainly isn't the uh, the reason for this here. Uh, as Daniel has mentioned, our current situation is we're we're we're, we're silent on this matter as it was as, as an authority. Um, and our policy direction. Um, so this just basically gives us a, a statement around that, whether some of the phrasing and the wording is exactly as we would wish it to be at this point in time, I think is, is open for discussion. Um, but there's certainly no hidden agenda here. Chair, you mentioned that uh, the community halls fall outside. I don't think they do. I mean, but basically it's a, a carbon neutral council Everything that we own has to be included. We can't just say, oh, but the community halls are an exception. That's just, you know, the climate emergency that presents itself is not going to allow us to duck issues. The sea's still going to get warmer. We're still going to get wetter climate. We're still going to have more storms. We're still going to have people disadvantaged, irrespective of whether an asset is on the council balance sheet or not whether it's included in a 2025 goal or not we need to step up we've had three years with which to address the climate emergency since the council passed its motion on that other councils are doing a lot better than we are and um, i think we've got a lot of work to do and we can't just be saying oh yeah well let's put it off for another five years that's just not good enough thank you councillor mccormick i do believe the plan was approved by council um councillor mckay uh, it's not a question really just to add my voice to those who've already expressed concern about the two bullet points that talk about alternative arrangements and selling assets and so on. It's, it's the one part of the report that um, jumped out at me and alarmed me the most when I read it. And I just want to convey the message that that feeling is, is more than just a couple of people who've spoken already. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. I've got Councillor Carruthers, then Councillor Mullaney. Thank you, Chair. Mine's more of a comment than a question. Um, just reading page five of the Strengthening Community Strategy, and we talk about our commitment and our ask of communities, and we mention here, volunteer, volunteer your time to help out in your local community. Obviously, as a borough councillor, but also as a resident and as a mother, I'm involved in lots and lots of different fantastic groups in our community who do some incredible work. But what I notice is that I go to lots of these meetings and I go to lots of these groups and you see the same people and there's these heroes in our communities who are involved in lots of things and they're, they're very often invisible and there's a lot that happens in our communities that are down to quite often a small number of people. And I would love to see a campaign, a, maybe a borough wide. We talked about mental health this evening because we talked about young people being engaged in things. It would be fantastic to see some sort of campaign or project that we as a borough could do to actively try and encourage people to get more involved in these groups in their communities because um, there's huge benefits to it. And there's lots of people that um, benefit from it but don't necessarily get involved. So I'd love to see some, maybe some case studies and some, you know, doing us doing something to show people how to get involved and the benefits of getting involved. Thank you. I believe officers will take that comment on board. Yeah. 
certainly something we've done in the past and I think that you know there's there's plenty of opportunity to do in the future and and um, sort of some of the things we talk about in terms of how we would understand what sort of um, you know sort of what we're committing to do over that period is around promoting volunteering and that's that's both you know sort of us as the council but equally with with other organizations who are relevant to that such as BVA and also with partner organizations as well so yes and um, I completely agree that you know sort of it is common to see the same individuals stepping up in you know sort of various different places and I think a lot of the shift over the last few years has been on the recognition that volunteering has been quite traditional in many ways so it's it's been quite difficult and I think people have very busy lives so being able to fit it in around what you've got going on can be can be incredibly difficult and there's been that real shift towards a different way of volunteering and it might it's not necessarily having to give a certain number of hours every week to the same thing and it's about it's more about what skills that you might have to provide you know sort of can you help with the setup maybe of a website or doing a little bit around social media but there are opportunities that could be remote rather than in person so it's kind of that it, you know sort of that the real importance is recognizing the challenges that exist for individuals and how what what we ask of them can can shift and respond to that so yes definitely i think i agree yeah thank you thank you councillor mama maloney thank you chair <clears throat> mine also a little bit of combination of comments as well as questions uh, i agree with my colleagues uh, i'm seriously concerned about uh, ownership transformation model or even uh, a model of giving it to some property management companies who manage the apartments like so you know any of these models really don't work uh, which I'm completely against that um, the second thing that I would like to mention is um, uh, is uh, as a borrow uh, I think we are heavily relying on uh, one or two voluntary organizations so they they may become our single point of failure uh, in future. So, and where is the competition? And it is good to have the competition within the voluntary sector still. So otherwise, how do we know that we are getting the best of it? So I think we need always need to think about that area. Uh, another one is, um, you know, I, I fail to find the guidelines to identify a community to give a community center to. Uh, right now we are handpicking it, and okay, oh, okay, can you run this one and we are giving it. So this strategy document, it will be good to have a set of guidelines if someone wants to run a community center, then they need to, they need to approach the council and there should be a proper mechanism to select uh, a, a, a community to run it, a community center. Uh, and Another important link that is uh, that is missing in this strategy is just like uh, green space and uh, other play fields requirements in the planning, um, a link to the community space requirement for each dwelling will be very useful. Like what is the specification says? And especially I, I would like to comment here about m my ward. Uh, there is a lot of permitted development happens in the tower blocks, which are all being converted into, uh, commercial spaces are converted into the dwellings, and they don't need to meet any of these uh, uh, community guidelines or the planning guidelines they'll get right away. But a new developer is coming across. He has to take uh, the figures of the entire borough. Currently, we have you know, 3,000 dwellings, and each dwelling is required this much square meter of it, but we don't have those much. So I would like to see at least a pointer to this document and a comparison league chart where each word stands with respect to the, uh, with respect to the community space availability in that ward. Uh, and finally, <laughs> I'm very con concerned about seek financial contributions through the planning system for community facilities that is in 2.11. So are we not already doing with, with respect to the section 106 and why we are introducing again?
So you know, on your question around allocation of community facilities in upper upper dwellings and um, and commu new communities, I think you know I'm looking to my colleague from Cannes in there. <laughs> uh, so it's very much you know that would be picked up as part of the account, the local plan. So I think it's not referenced in here because it's not you know this is not about you know how we can have allocated you know new communities and kind of new communities. That that's kind of very much the local plan. And the same I think you know, on the green spaces again that that is kind of a local plan policy. So I think that would be picked up you know, by by, by uh, my colleague Ruth and, and her colleagues. Um, on the section 106 element, no, it's not new. We're just kind of reiterating the point, you know, that we will carry on seeking, you know, developer contributions to support new community facilities. Um, just referencing the first point, just in terms of, I, I think we're talking about the community and voluntary sector and about competition within the sector. Um, I think that's also worth recognising that actually what we can potentially see across the sector is that um, uh, and what we would seek to avoid as much as possible is kind of that duplication of effort as well and part of that is about um, working with the sector to understand what the need is out there and how that can best be met um, and where you've kind of got different organisations with different strengths to be able to deliver against that so I think that's the importance of working closely with organisations like BVA um, and other representative forums and groups to understand what the needs are out there, but equally um, what, um, what skills exist within the sector to be able to deliver against those. So part of, and a part of that comes about also because um, not everybody knows what's going on out there and what other people are delivering as well. So there's, there's, I suppose part of the intention of this is to do what we can to try and, um, to try and encourage collaboration across the community and voluntary sector. There's a huge amount that's going on. There's massive benefit that's being derived for the community. Um, and I think if we, we do more around collaboration, and we, we saw you know, sort of going back to the pandemic that we're, we've seen huge collaboration across the sector. Um, and that has been about recognising where certain organisations have certain strengths and how they can complement each other in order to deliver the greatest benefit for the community. And I think we would seek to encourage that more and more going forward and that is also part of about building sustainability as well. Does that answer that? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Lovely. So I have Councillor Mahaffey, then Councillor Compton Burnett, then Councillor Pollock Maitland. Councillor Mahaffey. Thank you, Chair. I just want to pick up on the comment that Councillor Carruthers made, which I fully support and I think everybody uh, around this table has experience of, of there is in all of our communities a hard core of people who sort of uh, do all the voluntary stuff. Uh, and I, I support what uh, Councillor Carruthers says about it would be lovely to see some fresh faces. I believe, and this is broad stereotypes, there are three types of, or three stereotypes of people in this kind of conversation we're talking about. There are those that naturally put their hand up, want to get involved, want to be part of it, and I would include everyone around this table in that group, I suspect. There are those at the other end of the spectrum who really don't want to be involved in the community and you, know, you won't get them out of their front door, come what may. But I think the lot in the middle, there is a very large card of people who could be encouraged to, to get involved with their community, to volunteer, to whatever it is, if we could provide them with the right touch points to, to, to kick them off on that journey. And I think that is where the challenge lies, is giving them that touch point. Because you mentioned earlier that we're going we're to have a campaign to get people involved. Well, you know, we'll do what we always do. And the, we're limited by what we can do. We'll put something on Facebook, put something on the website, put something in the newspapers, maybe do a leaflet drop. Um, if I could suggest something that we do in my village of Silchester, we actually monitor the, um, the, the housing market. So we monitor when uh, new residents move in. Uh, and we actually, in their first week of being there, or when we think they've actually moved in, we put a welcome pack through the door, which includes all the community facilities, which includes all the voluntary things that go on, which includes a few names to get in touch. Um, because I think that's the point at which people are most, I don't want to use the word susceptible, but they're most open to being engaged with their community because they've just moved into a new house, so they're, in, they're interested in what's going on. You know, if you do a mail drop with, with people who have been there for 20 years, you know, we're all, it gets mixed up with the Domino's Pizza mail drop and it's not so, you know, so if I could suggest maybe that as a, as a possible way of engaging people. It works well for us as a very small community. I don't know if it would transfer to the broader borough. Yeah, thank you for that, Councillor McCarthy. I think that this, you, you've hit very much on the nub of this uh, paper here and the strategy, which is about empowering communities to do their own work and support. 
And it's obviously from what you're saying that your community has embraced that by going out and, and they've empowered themselves to go out and approach those people, as you say, at a, a point when they're very open to, to new opportunities and ideas. Um, and that's why we are promoting those things. It's not a role that we as a district council can be involved in, I don't think, but it is something that we can support any number of voluntary community, voluntary sector organisations in doing by identifying good practice and good ideas. And that's what, we're, that's what we look to spread. Um, and I'm really pleased that, you know, that suggestion, because I think that is, that is a, good, a, a good thing that could be modelled out in other areas. Um, could we just not work with uh, estate agents? Give them a pack, and so as soon as somebody moves in, these are, uh, and obviously not a borough-wide estate agent, but actually something targeted at the local residents. So look, when somebody moves in, give them this courtesy of the borough and welcome to the to their community. Uh, I think the the difficulty you you have there, and and you highlighted it in your original statement, is that it is about those local contacts, those local um, touch points. Uh, and things like that, and I'm afraid to say some, you know, those those change quite a lot. And 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 whilst it's easy for, or not easy, but it, it's a manageable piece of work for the community to keep track of that. For us to do that on a borough wide basis would be, you know, we'd have to employ a couple of staff, quite frankly, to do it. But it's but it's excellent practice and excellent empowerment of the local community. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you know, we've one of the reasons we're looking to work more closely with BBA is is it is about them supporting and providing ideas exactly like that to various local communities and enhancing that good practice. Lovely, Councillor Compton Bennett. Thank you, and thank you for your excellent strategy. It's great to see it all coming together. Um, I wanted to touch on three areas, please. The first one's community facilities, the second one is funding, and the third one is BBA. Um, so looking first at community facilities, I wholeheartedly echo what's already been said about um, the community facilities and the importance of keeping them um, because they're so valuable. Um, one thing that I was struck was the emphasis on enhancing old buildings rather than building new ones, and I think particularly with regard to the carbon neutral policy. We need to be open-minded about that. Um, looking also at the um, SLAs, um, later on it, it talks about the importance of, of having SLAs, and I'm all <coughs> in favor of that. We must make best use of these assets um, but I, in order to build resilience. But I think it's very important we support the people managing the community centers to meet the SLAs. We work with them because it's a tough job, as um, I'm sure Councillor James very well knows. Um, looking then at um, grant funding, um, I think one big problem that VCSEs have is being funded year on year. They can't really plan. It's very, very difficult. And I'm wondering whether we can try harder to help them, to work with them to look ahead to see what's coming through in the future so that they can do proper plans. Um, because obviously all of the initiatives they do take time to put together and get people on board. Um, and also with um, in 3.3 it talks about the future grant funding arrangements. And I just want to check that CEP will be involved in reviewing those, please. And, ah yes, and on page 64 it talks about requiring match funding. Um, I don't think we should require match funding because it's of, often very difficult to come by. It might just be a wording thing, but it, it seems very much there that we need, they need to get match funding when often that won't be possible. And finally, just to talk about BVA, which I think does an amazing job, um, I think it's very important to make sure they have the correct amount of resources. Um, so that's staff and finance. We're asking them to do an awful lot of things to support VCSEs in applying for grants, um, help them with training, help, help them in the work that the VCSEs do. But um, that needs a, a lot of funding for BBA, and I think we need to make absolutely sure that we give them what they need to do the job. Um, and particularly, I mean, talking to them recently, things like uh, building a directory of services, which we've alluded to. You know, loads of people are doing fantastic things in Basingstoke, but it's often very difficult to know who's doing what. 
And that's one thing they particularly want to do to build that directory. But my understanding is they haven't got the money to do it. So can we please look at what they need and make sure they have it? Thank you. Um, Colin, I was just going to go through your, your points. So regarding the uh, the community facilities, I think you know, obviously we, we take the, the comment on board, and I think you know, it's more about language in the paper. Regarding for new versus old, I think, again, it would on very much be a case-by-case -case basis of what would be best for that community at that time. You know, sometimes it might be a new facility, you know, based on say, some contribution, or something that might just be an extension of what there is already. Um, on the funding side of things, so at the moment, you know, we are a bit of a transition period, as you know. Um, we've got kind of a one-year arrangement, you know, to have a, to, to try a new grant scheme with the uh, working with VBA. Uh, you know, we want to take lessons learned and, and kind of then working alongside that on the new a new approach to community and also the uh, funding and absolutely at the kind of, you know, consult DCEP. Uh, I expect this to be sort of um, kind of late summer, uh, early autumn, probably kind of late summer, September, September time. Once we've done the work, but you know, definitely come to CP to get your your views and your and your comments. Um, just wanted to pick up on the um, comment about BBA as well in terms of support and you know, so it's our absolutely our intention to continue to work alongside and support BBA and recognising that obviously what's you know sort of the ask is huge, isn't it really? Um, in terms of the scale of the sector and making sure that the right advice and guidance is provided and out there. But equally, you know, so they've got ambition to be able to to do that and to respond and, and they're in conversations both with us and equally with other partner organisations as well looking forward in terms of what the ask is and how they can best position themselves to be able to respond to that, that. So yeah, it's, it's certainly as part of that, our commitment is working alongside and equally supporting them to be able to deliver that and it, for it to be very much a sector-led approach. Councillor Pollock Maitland. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd like to add uh, a mixture of comment and question, if I could. Um, firstly, to add my voice uh, to those councillors saying that they feel nervous about uh, exploring opportunities for asset tran transfers. Um, that really s doesn't sit well with me at all. Um, but I also question, I mean, it's all very well talking about community cohesion, providing essential services, etc., etc. But the one thing that a lot of community associations won't have is financial resilience, particularly after the last couple of years when they haven't been able to be open and earning um, the, the kind of income that they need to keep to keep going. Uh, they won't have unrestricted reserves. So I can't, uh, you know, if it, it's one thing I feel uncomfortable about the concept of asset transfers, but also I'm curious to find out what mechanism is envisaged is it social impact investing that there aren't very many revenue streams to be gained um, and particularly uh, and this is my second point um, i'd like to explore the interrelationship with hampshire county council services so for example for example in whitchurch jill nethercott center houses uh, whitchurch library and as we all know, um, library service, Hampshire County Council, under huge pressure. So that is a, an inc income stream in terms of rent is itself precarious. So we're, we're on very sticky ground in terms of income as it is. And the third and final point I have, well, third point I have is on building sustainability. I would love to find grant funding to get uh, water source pumps for the Jill Nethercott Centre. Um, if the planning department can tell me where I can find it, I'll go for it. But that's definitely something I think uh, there could be greater communication with. Uh, and final point is just picking up on something that uh, Councillor Carruthers has said about um, volunteers. Um, you know, there, there's a huge... Uh, I would say uh, age profile, um, it, it definitely seems to be older residents and call me cynical but I, I tend to see younger people putting their effort into changing a Facebook profile to show their support for a cause or adding to a just giving page which whilst it's being proactive and altruistic that's not going to open the doors of a community centre. So somehow we've got to bridge that gap between online 
showing of support and actually doing something within the community. I, I like what uh, Councillor Mahavi's said in terms of the welcome pack. That, that's a really nice touch and community spirited and I think that's hopefully something that we can steal from you. So thank you. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take the first one and then I'll take the hand over to Sam. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, councillors are concerned about this, the question of the asset transfer. And I, I'd, I'd quite like to put this one to bed, really, um, which is just to, to be clear that, that the moment we have nothing, no, that, you know, we're, we're silent on this matter. Um, and the purpose of this as a strategy document rather than a policy document is to set the, the direction and the opportunities here. Um, so we've taken the view that this is something we would, you know, that there is a possibility. It is no more than that. There is no drive, there is no push, there is no trend towards this, but we have to just have a position on it. Uh, and if we are approached, and I come back to the point from the councillor here, you know, there needs to be a fully fleshed out policy that relates to this and policy comes after this one. So there is no push to, to sell off all these centres, um, but we do have to just cater for that option and that possibility should it come forward from the community and it would have to come forward from the community rather than anything else. Does that offer you some reassurance or to Possibly. <laughs> I'll wait and see. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Tisdale. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to emphasise, it, it is sort of hinted at, but it doesn't come out very strongly. One thing that concerns me, and this does kind of tie in a bit on the whole getting volunteers, um, there are some places where I think getting volunteers is not about a lack of willingness, but people don't have the time. Their lives are very, very difficult um, you know and they may be working two or three jobs they may be living with antisocial behavior next door it's keeping them up all night and getting them out and start so oh, come on let's go out and start you know um, tidying up the area or helping old people and being a buddy or something they're like for god's sake my life's hard enough so it's being mindful of that making sure i mean talk we'll talk about you know the clarifying the council's role but enabling and facilitating communities to take on more to make to, on issues that are important to them. Obviously, it depends what those issues are, making it clear. So I think it just needs to come out quite strongly that um, it's the right support. It is sort of hinted at in 2.9, but it's just making sure that that's there. I also like the idea of um, these welcome packs, but when we've got a lot of residents that are moved about between different housing association places and possibly have come from being homeless or at risk of being homeless, I think the last thing they'll want is that, but that's... Uh, and obviously that would have to be sensitively managed if we did anything like that anyway. Thank you. Councillor Fox. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, I'm just mindful that quite a lot of people have uh, brought up uh, volunteering, you know, <coughs> Councillor Carruthers, Councillor Mahaffey, um, uh, Councillor, uh, Councillor Tustain and various. Um, and I was at an event um, the other morning where we were talking about volunteering in the community. And I was struck by a lot of young people that I talked to there who were expressing what it's like to volunteer themselves. And what came clearly home to me is there's something about schools and colleges and um, supporting children to think um, that volunteering really is a good thing to do and it helps them on multiple levels. It, it, you know, it, it builds friendship groups, it helps their CV, it gives them life experiences, it does all sorts of things. Um, so I, I thought that was one of the things that came across. Um, and the other thing that I thought was interesting is that they volunteer in lots and lots and lots of different places. You know, one of the young women I was talking to was saying, she said, I feel quite bad about it because I just do a tiny little bit for this one here. I do a tiny bit there. Did you think I should try and rationalise them and, and bring them into one? You know, and I think, no, <laughs> no, if you enjoy doing all those little little bits and pieces for all sorts of different people, then do that because it's about what you want to do. So I think young young people want to do these things. It's um, about setting them on the path quite early, I think. And then, um, because I think then, although I absolutely appreciate that for some people, particularly in particular times of your life, it's very difficult to fit in volunteering. But 
I think um, for a lot of people, it, it gives you back as much as you put in, and it's well worth doing. But um, the BVA, um, Council of Carruthers, have um, set up quite an interesting sort of exchange online where people can register what they're looking for, what charity and volunteering groups are looking for, what skills there might be. So it might be a bit of website stuff or it might be something else. And then you can go along and have a look and they match people uh, what you'd like to do with what, uh, what's required by voluntary groups. And, and that, that's quite an interesting one that I think might be attractive for young people because they can do that remote from um, sort of face-to-face -face kind of contacts. They can explore it without feeling as if they're suddenly having to, to go along to the village hall at nine o'clock and meet people they don't know. You know, they can, they can um, a, a go at it quite slowly. So that's just one idea, but I think it's quite a good one. Thanks. Thank you. I think one, one just, just very quickly to come back on that, I, I think, um, you know, perhaps our job as councillors is, is to actually make sure that our local groups are aware of this, that, that they, they can register um, with BVA. So just an additional point on that as well, it's worth noting that as part of National Volunteers Week that BVA do an awful lot of promotion around volunteering as well um, and it's something that gets promoted through colleges but I think that's you know, sort of a useful point to take away is how that, um, sort of what gets promoted towards young people and, and how that might get strengthened into the future because it's absolutely right, there's a lot of young people who are very keen to volunteer and, and already do, or a lot of them do already do that, so it's about how we locally look at how we can strengthen that and draw upon that for our local organisations to bring benefit to us. Lovely. So one, oh no, two last comments. Please, could you both keep it quite short because my time schedule has just gone out the window. Councillor Mahaffey. Well, thank you, Chair. I should whisper to me, but you're very, very short, so it'll be very quick. Don't answer this. Here's a proposal. Here's, here's a proposal for you. I'll go around, I'm, I'm thinking about your comments earlier, Rob, about uh, it would mean employing people to, to develop these world compacts. Here's a proposal. I'm going to raise the money. We develop it as a website uh, that is managed by me or somebody. You know, that's easy to manage. We get uh, Council Fort Maitland, Council Sustain, whoever else wants to be involved to nominate an individual in their community or a group in their community to manage their individual page. We then work with the, um, and I'll, I'm happy to do this, send it out to all the uh, uh, estate agents, so that when a house, tr uh, when a transaction on a house happens, all you've got to do is get somebody to say, press the, the Whitchurch button, and everything downloads, chuck it in an envelope and send it out. Would that work? Don't answer. I'd like to, I'd like to speak to you about it afterwards. I think that was short. Councillor Poland. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair. Obviously, in the... Uh, in the rural areas, all of these uh, organisations are put in the parish magazine, so you can find out exactly who to go to if you should want to. I think we should uh, not underestimate, of course, the, the communication word. We saw this in this country when we hosted the Olympic Games. The, the number of people that were keen to support and help was astronomical. And more recently, of course, the tragic events in Ukraine have unleashed a huge amount, huge amount of support. And it actually shows really what the Great British Public is all about, actually a very caring organisation and number of people. So the people are there, it's just a question of how we actually get them to do what we hope we want to do. Thank you, Councillor Poland. So I'm going to try and attempt to sum up what everyone said this evening. Um, I think the committee was um, pretty unanimously concerned um, about the strength of the wording around seeking alternative arrangements for community centres in terms of management um, and there was concerns raised for about the future resilience of independent centres, be that in terms of volunteers um, or uh, financially. The committee were reassured that that was not the default setting, um, but I think committee would like the, the, it reworded. Uh, the importance of incorporating our carbon neutral targets for community centres was also raised. Um, significant discussion around uh, promoting volunteering firm and trying to encourage more new volunteers, do that by case studies, local newsletters, targeting people as they move in, um, but particularly trying to encourage young people to volunteer um, and to transform online activism into action in our communities. Um, I think, gosh, uh, 
Service level agreements were seen as general po generally positive, but that I would also support would need to be built in from the council, at least at first. Um, strength of BVA was definitely um, uh, acknowledged and the importance of the council continuing to work very closely with them, um, but also uh, with a wider spread of voluntary organisations as well in an attempt to coordinate their effort. Um, and I think I'm probably not wrong in saying um, the committee members would be interested in some information from BVA about getting young people into volunteering. Nobody's glaring at me from the committee, so I'm going to take that as I manage to do that. Right, it is working out to be quite a long evening. Um, can I suggest we take just a five minute break and come back at 10 to 9?
Good evening again, everyone. I believe we're all back. Um, so if you could re-attend to the meeting. Um, break time is over, and I don't want to put you on a timeout. Um, so now, on to our climate change update. Councillor Raphael, would you like to introduce it? Well, good evening to you, Chair and Committee. We said we'd come back, and we're back. So here it is. It's an update. It's not the finished article. It's just sort of saying we're at it, we're on it, and you're going to hear more about it now. Thank you, Councillor Fell. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to introduce Sam Taylor, who's going to help me with questions after the short introduction. I've got maybe 10 or 11 slides, so I'll, I'll rattle through them because I know time is a little, little short. Um, basically, all I'm going to do is recap on the um, October report when we brought you to you the annual summary of where we're up to with implementation of the strategy. Uh, a bit on the progress since then, our current work areas and focus for our, our, our present time, and then where we're, where we're heading in the future in terms of talking to committee and, and engaging with you uh, down the line. And we've also got a bit of a homework we might want you to take away and, and help us with. So just, just in terms of uh, where, what we updated on in October, we touched on the emissions that we produce as an authority and the borough-wide emissions. I think at that stage we were reporting that our emissions as an authority in terms of our operations had dropped by about a third compared to the previous year. In part it was linked to COVID and the way we were functioning as an authority so that there was that caveat to bear in mind. And borough wide emissions, there's a lag in terms of getting the, the, the data from the government. So the latest data we have is from 2019, but it was showing a general decline uh, in emissions in, in the borough. Obviously this has benefits in terms of air quality uh, and uh, linked link to carbon that comes comes from um, from travelling, for example. But again, there, there are some benefits that link back through to, to the lockdown and the way we, we weren't moving around quite as much. We talked to, to committee about the four priority areas at the time, and I'll go through these in a little more detail, but it was around our property portfolio, particularly our, our operational portfolio. That's things like this building and our depots and pavilions. Um, how we're working with the local plan team in terms of developing a, a set of policies to go into the new the new local plan, uh, rolling out our electric vehicle charging infrastructure across the borough and the climate change toolkit for residents and communities. Uh, and we also touched on how we're talking to some key groups in the community, the Low Carbon Energy Forum, um, the Members Advisory Panel, some of which, some of whom, whom are here this evening, and the Transition Town Network. Um, so we, we talked around some positive moves there. And we also talked around how we've embedded um, climate change considerations into committee reports that come before you so that when, when, uh, when decisions are made, there's consideration given to climate change matters. Just some good news to start off with, in that uh, we were able to uh, appoint to two new newly created roles in the team. Uh, they joined us earlier this year, um, so that, that's really good. It means we can start to deliver on the many actions we've got in the adopted climate change strategy, which is great news. And we've also now got a dedicated comms resource who's going to be able to work with us to deliver actions to, to affect behaviour change with residents and to support them uh, with, with um, addressing climate change issues at home. Um, so that they're now with us and we're now fully staffed, which is great news. Uh, in terms of the residents and community toolkit, I think it's probably useful to touch on this briefly, but um, we published it in November and it linked, it tied in quite neatly with the COP26 that was hosted in Cornwall uh, last year. It, it really talks around how residents and community groups can uh, take forward actions to deliver climate change, reduce emissions, perhaps save some money at home and perhaps in community centres, which I know a number of you have raised concerns around this evening. So it's really broken down into those residents who want to, want to have some quick wins, perhaps not spending too much, through to those that have got some more money to spend and invest time and effort into uh, take, to making changes at home and equally in community centres. It's been really well received. Um, we're seeing it as a living document and we're keen to hear comments on it and to make updates as, as new advice comes forward so that we can begin, we can continue that dialogue with residents. And we're looking to continue to promote it through B&D today and using our new resources. Uh, the local plan, um, we, as I mentioned, we've had some really good conversations with the Low Carbon Energy Forum and we've got a, a set of policies now that have been considered by EPH committee uh, that met last week and I think the, the policies on climate change were well received. We've tried to embed climate change as a golden thread that runs through the whole of the plan so that you know it's, it's embedded in as many places as possible and it keeps coming back to the fact that we, we need to be reducing carbon emissions through new developments. So it was, it was discussed at EPH committee last week 
and that will go forward to consultation later in the year as part of the local plan in its entirety. We're focused on, on our operational portfolio as well um, in terms of, so th this really is addressing those buildings where we pay the energy bill. So that's this building, the Aquadrome, the, the Tadley Pool, and some of the operational buildings like Wade Road and some of the pavilions and public conveniences, that kind of thing. We've had audit, energy audits undertaken on the Aquadrome and Tadley Pool. The results came up very recently back with us and we are holding a procurement type mini competition to move forward with energy audits for the remaining building and they're poised to go in the next few days. Um, we expect the actual energy audits more widely to be undertaken in May and that will allow us to start to develop a capital program looking ahead as to how, what kind of improvements we could make. And we've also had the opportunity to embed climate change into things like the property investment strategy and the asset management plan so that it's, it's very much a, uh, a key consideration in those documents moving forwards. Um, EV charging, we're now doing some really good work with Hampshire. We've, you're probably familiar with the fact we've got some EV charges in our car parks in uh, Feathers Yard in Basingstoke and more recently in Overton and Whitchurch. And we're now looking at a second phase of that to roll out uh, charging in on-street locations for those uh, residents that don't have access to private driveways. So we've got a number of locations that we're looking to um, uh, develop those and to submit a funding bid via Hampshire County Council in the next next couple of weeks I think uh, to begin to, to drive that forwards um, and if successful and there's, a, there's an if there because it's subject to government funding but it would look to around 40 locations with around 70 charging points in a, a number of town centre wards and in uh, some settlements outside of Basingstoke too so we'll begin to begin to publish publicize that in the next few days hopefully um, just in terms of, of some other things that have been taking place uh, all climate change strategies across the country have been evaluated by uh, charitable organisation to see how, they, how they're performing. And we had some good results for Basingstoke and Dean, it was above average. I think we came in with a score of 54% compared to an average of 46%. So we recognise we're doing better than, than most, but equally we recognise that we're on a journey and there's more that we can be doing, so we're keen to move forward with that. Um, Sam ran a training session for members a month or two back. Uh, a number of, of you may have been there, but I think that was well received and we're beginning to work with members in terms of an e-learning module as well as staff as well. Uh, we've launched a funding scheme called Low Case, which is uh, focused on, um, on businesses in the borough where they're able to receive grant funding to make improvements where it improves energy performance in, in, their, in their operations. Uh, so we're looking to promote that as widely as we can. And more recently, we've been successful in as part of a partnership uh, for local authority delivery funding to help residents who uh, fall within certain um, income brackets and where their homes um, are poorly, perhaps um, have low EPC standards. I think it's D-rated or lower. So there, there's, there's a pot of money available that we can support residents to access through the LAD scheme. Um, I'll touch very briefly on EV charging and I think that that's going to be a key focus of our team going forward so we, we, we look to implement that during 2022-23. Uh, I've touched on the property work and I think we'll begin to develop that into a capital programme moving forwards once we have the energy audits back with us. Um, in terms of our operational fleet you'll be aware that we operate a number of tractors, road sweepers, transit, that kind of thing and we've got a significant uh, pot of money that's set aside for, for replacement of those as they need to be renewed. So as they, as they come up for renewal, we take a proactive, look at, proactive approach now of making sure that we uh, purchase the, the most appropriate vehicles and where there's a, a low carbon or electric vehicle, we're, we're making that choice. To that effect, we have just placed an order for two new uh, vehicles for the CSPOs. Um, uh, we're getting two new um, electric MGs that should be with us in the next month or two and they, they, they supplement the vehicles that the parking team currently use. And I suppose a, a relatively new um, point here is that we are looking at the scope to use an alternative fuel source for those vehicles that don't readily lend themselves to electric vehicles. It's called HVO, it stands for Hydrogenated Vegetable Oil, and it's effectively 90%, uh, it, it produces 90% fewer emissions than a, than a normal vehicle. Um, at, at tailpipe effectively, so that's something that we're looking at at the moment and to see whether, whether our fleet of operations vehicles could make use of that. 
Um, going forward, we're also looking to um, get a better handle on our carbon emissions and how we calculate those and how we can work out how, where we're heading in the future. So we've got a better grip on what measures we need to take so that we get our best bang for our buck with our limited resources effectively. Our new areas of focus with our, with our new recruits is around public engagement and affecting behaviour change. So it's working out what our target audiences are in our community and how best we can work with them to um, deliver change at home or in their communities. So that, that's going to be a key area of focus. I think that will supplement a future um, council resident survey coming forwards. We're looking to develop a new council travel plan. The one we've got is quite on, long in the tooth and needs in, is in need of, of a refresh. And we're working closely with the natural environment team. Um, you'll be aware that we declared it an ecological emergency. I think it was unanimously passed by council back in October, November last year. So we're looking at ways to work with the natural environment team to take those forwards. There is some overlap there, and I think we need to make sure that we, we work in tandem with colleagues. Um, but we do recognise that the natural environment effectively sequesters carbon through the way that we manage our, our natural environment and our, our property. And we're looking to, to work out how we can maximise that, as well as ensuring biodiversity benefits down the line. Um, and I'm conscious we've got a, a presentation by a colleague on the next item on the agenda to talk about the Eastern Basin State project. So that's one of the, the live projects that's coming to life now. Just in terms of speaking to committee, I think we, we committed to come back to CEP three times per year. So once with an annual report around November, December time, and a check-in, as, as this is this evening, around March, April time, and then June, July time. So that it's part of an ongoing dialogue, uh, ensuring that members have an understanding of the work underway and to, to keep us informed of the, the, the areas where we should be focusing. In terms of some homework for a committee, I think we're really keen that you, you help to spread the word of, of the work we're undertaking. So if you're able to share the climate ch change toolkit with your residents, that would be much appreciated. And any feedback that you have on, on what's in the toolkit would be much appreciated. More than happy to send around a link to that so you've got easy access to it. It's uh, to, to promote the, the low case schemes to, to SMEs that are operating in your areas so that get um, so that they can benefit from the money that's available to, to support them. <coughs> Again, more than happy to circulate a short email just to give you some, some pointers. And also around the, the, um, the, the, the scheme to support residents who may be in lower income brackets and who are living in poorly insulated homes. And also if you're able to, to spread the word amongst parish councils you may be involved in, schools, uh, places of worship or any other community groups, because I'm sensing that that members have got a good way into to many groups at the grassroots level. I think that pretty much concludes the whistle-stop tour of climate change, but obviously more than happy to take questions and to uh, come back to you. Excellent. Now, before we get too distracted in this, because hands are shooting up already, um, I'm afraid we're not going to get done by 9.30 because we've got this item and another item um, and then our committee agenda. Um, so could I get committee's agreement to suspend standing orders until 10 o'clock, please? Excellent. Thank you very much. In which case, Councillor Mahaffey, then Councillor Crothers. Thank you, Chair. Um, Andrew, uh, Mark, sorry. Thank you for that. Um, great that we've got 54% versus a, a national average of 48%. Uh, but in terms of a, an old-fashioned GCE O level, that's a C grade. So first question is, who got the top score? What are they doing that we're not doing? What do we need to do to get 100%? That's my first question. Second question is, uh, HVA um, is basically chip fat. Uh, Reading buses were used in chip fat 15, 20 years ago. Why, what's different now? Why are we only looking at it now and... Why? What? In terms of the your first question around where we are in the league table, effectively, I understand those towards the top of the league table are those who are generally perhaps the London boroughs or some of the county councils who have more of a property portfolio. They may be um, they may be operating schools, and so they've got more boxes ticked effectively in that sense. Um, so that that's part of the reason. Um, I know in Hampshire we 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 we, we uh, scored second after Fareham. Um, so I think what we're doing now with our new resources is seeing how we could do better and how we could improve that score in the future so that we, we are performing uh, you know, better across the board in that sense. I think we do recognise it's part of the journey that we're on. In terms of your second question about HVOs and Reading buses, 
again, I think it's really been brought to light by um, a trial that Hampshire are undertaking and our, our ability to tap into them effectively. And it's also partly perhaps been brought on by the, the increasing fuel costs that, are, that we're all experiencing and need to have a better um, source of those of that uh, fuel to, to power our fleet. Quick sample of Edward. Could I ask when you uh, go through that, presumably you're going to go through some sort of benchmarking exercise against somebody like Fairham or, or a comparable uh, borough, could you come back to us with that and just say where they're doing better than we are? Absolutely, Thank that's something we could bring back to committee Thank in the next update. Thank you. Councillor Crothers. Thank you, Chair. Um, just a couple of things. Um, the community toolkit, um, I just, so, uh, just a thought really is, is there a way we can use it to promote some <coughs> local businesses that we have got in the borough who are doing their bit? Um, uh, I know certainly in Tadley we've got a couple of businesses. We've got one lady who um, she she runs a business whereby people take um, their refills to her and she fills them back up with washing up liquid or whatever it is and, and they take them away again. So that, that there are some great businesses like this popping up and of course um, you know they're all supporting our cause. So I just wonder if, if there's a way we could look at, at, at kind of recognising some of those those small businesses um, and, and maybe even rewarding them or acknowledging them anyway. Um, and secondly, EV charging. Um, I've been contacted by a resident in my ward who lives in a flat which is owned by a housing association. So I just wonder what work we're doing on that because um, Obviously, yeah, that, that's something we need to be looking at. Thank you. Just in terms of your, fir your first point about um, recognising local refill type companies, I think that's something we can take away and think about how we can best promote. Um, and in terms of EV charges, I'm conscious that is a live issue and we are in dialogue with the housing associations to understand how they can move this kind of issue forward. I know it's on their agendas as well because they probably have residents knocking on their door saying, how do I charge my car? So it's a live issue, perhaps something that we can again explore in a bit more detail and bring back to, to the committee. Lovely. Uh, Councillor Tustain, then Councillor Bailey. Thank you, Chair. Um, got a few points. Actually, this is about some of the things that are sort of internal. And um, one of the big things that I feel really strongly about is the whole way um, waste management with the new environmental bill and getting the recycling rates up. We're, we're an appalling borough, I'm afraid, with 297th out of 330 as far as recycling rates go. And I was really disappointed to see that the latest performance target, we're basically we're just not making any difference. Now, I know twin recycling has gone to cabinet, um, but there are other places that are already doing food waste weekly collections. Um, you know, we, we need to be moving on with this. And if we're going to be promoting and encouraging our residents to use the toolkit to do their bit, they are going to be coming straight back to us and saying, well, you know, why are we so rubbish at doing this? So that, that's an internal one. Obviously, it's how much influence you can put on your fellow officers internally for that one. Um, and the other one, actually, is also environmental, is things like the park planting schemes, which are um, I do believe, I don't know if it has been changed yet or if it is in the plans. At the moment, we're using um, carbon heavy bedding plants each year. That's really not a good idea. We should be moving to more permanent perennial <coughs> planting schemes, as a lot of other local authorities are doing, which is something I don't know if that's been explored. And then um, next one is, is more of the sort of the joint thing, which is again joint with Hampshire, and that's the ideas around public transport, and that's something that's something else that's really obviously a very important topic that we really need to explore. I know there's a lot of difficulty around costs and subsidies and obviously the commercial arrangements, but it's what we're doing with that. And then the final one's external, which actually goes into the housing associations. How much work are we doing to make sure that they're adequately insulating and repairing and keeping their housing um, and making this carbon neutral as possible as well? Thank you. I'll pick up on the public transport one because that's something I, I'm most engaged with in terms of speaking to Hampshire on a regular basis. We are working closely with them at the moment to develop a kind of a high quality um, public transport network across the town 
such that it focuses on key corridors and tapping into the local plan allocations that will come forward down the line. So there's that desire between both authorities to create these networks so that people have a genuine choice of a high frequency, reliable, you know, in terms of journey times, reliability, that they can almost, you know, use as a genuine replacement for the car. And aside from that, we will, we're also working with them on a local cycling and walking infrastructure plan. You probably heard about this. So that that's kind of going in tandem alongside the public transport work. And we'll begin to see more detail on that later in the year as more detail emerges. And I can try and pick up a few of those other ones. So I think the the recycling point and the kind of waste and resources strategy, I guess you alluded to, which is a kind of government strategy on uh, potentially mandating lots of things in future. I think the kind of key overlap we see as a team with the, the waste and recycling team in particular is kind of minimizing consumption in the first place. So although um, agree that recycling is, a, is an issue that people uh, are really passionate about making sure it's they can they can do what, what they can um, I guess within the confines of kind of working with Hampshire and and the, the kind of infrastructure I guess we have locally uh, the kind of key messaging for us is, is let's not buy stuff we don't need in the first place let's not buy food we're going to throw away in the first place you know it's the it's the kind of transport the growing of these things for example that actually is responsible for most of these emissions um, the kind of disposal of it is is an issue but perhaps not not a key climate change issue so but we're certainly working in, in collaboration with that team on, on messaging a, a lot um, kind of the housing associations it, 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 the, they also have a key role housing uh, and housing in the borough the you know, requirements on housing associations and, and social housing generally is is actually quite high the stipulations there tend to mean that the condition of those properties are are better on average than you know, privately rented or, or some even own occupied funding um, the schemes that that mark mentioned things like the local authority delivery scheme and others that are around something also called the, the home upgrade uh, upgrade grant or the hug scheme i think that, uh, the acronym was probably designed first for something like that uh, are available and there's also you know we are in conversation particularly with sovereign and Viz vivid as a kind of main housing associations um, on supporting them for, for future funding that they're interested in and there's also what's called the social housing decarbonisation fund as well so kind of conversation is ongoing without any material uh, bids going in for those things yet um, uh, when appropriate I think the final one you, you talked about was was part planting and I think that's probably something we'll, we'll take away and, and pick up with colleagues future I'm not sure about plans on that but a, a really interesting idea Councillor Poland. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I believe I'm correct in saying that the recycling rate for the borough is poor or low. Perhaps you could just clarify whether I'm right or wrong. And if that is the case, what can we do to increase it? Um, this may not come into your orbit, but I never understand why, and this is probably as much a planning issue, why we do not insist on new builds. We actually now insist on them having solar panels. Uh, I mean, I read a report today that as a result of what's going on, the, the demand for solar panels has just gone exponentially massive. So there is a demand. I accept there's a cost factor. And, and the argument always on new builds is, well, people won't pay the cost of it. Actually, do you know what the cost of a solar panel is? Collection is about £5,000. And the average cost of a property now, it's peanuts. So, you know, we need to attack it from both ends. It's, it's great having EV charging points, but I can assure you that there is not enough infrastructure in the country, if we all go electric, to provide the joint electricity in the first place. And that's a very important point. And I think, picking up, I think, on what Councillor Carruthers said, um, it, it's a big bet in the wire of mine that businesses have no facility or encouragement to recycle. My own office in Reading, uh, or my building in Reading, which houses four businesses, collects a whole load of stuff. There is no benefit from either Reading Borough Council, and I suspect if I operated in Basingstoke and Dean, uh, Basingstoke and Dean, to actually either give me an encouragement. So what do you do? You encourage me this, chuck it in a black sack and stick it in the hole, which is completely ridiculous. And, you know, we're just going around in circles and with no disrespect, writing great ideas, but actually we need to address some of the very simple things. Picking up on Councillor Sustain's point, she's absolutely right. In Reading, they do pick up um, waste. I don't know, uh, uh, household waste that is, uh, food waste, I don't know how successful that is, but you know, it's a step in the right direction uh, and I just don't know why we're not trying to do some of these really simple, clever things. Not, they're not clever, they're practical things. 
I'm probably, Sam and I are probably aren't the best place to be honest to be able to comment too, in too much detail on the waste and recycling front. So we've, we've got colleagues that deal with that in, in um, you know, day to day is, is their day to day function. So I probably I wouldn't want to kind of delve down and give you give you an incorrect answer in that sense. Um, but I can respond in terms of the, your point around solar panels and uh, PV generally in, in new homes, and it's really part of the dialogue that we're having um, with the local plan team in terms of providing that new policy framework to guide and, and manage new development as it comes forward. So what you'll see when you see the policies is, is a series of three or four distinct policies that will seek to embed uh, climate change considerations into the way that they're built, the way that they're heated and the way it's insulated so that energy use is minimised uh, and what we end up with down in terms of delivery on the ground is a much better product than you may have been seeing in the past. And that, that could be through uh, PV um, solar panels as you say but I think more than likely, I think with a move away from gas that the government's mandating in terms of gas boilers, we'll begin to see much greater use of um, heat pumps, whether that's ground source heat pumps or air source heat pumps, which I think will be much more commonplace in new homes in the future in order to meet the standards that we're going to be demanding. Thank you. Councillor Mackay. I was going to ask one question, but I've actually got two because of the food waste point that was raised. Now, my understanding is that food waste collection induces shock. People don't realise just how much food they're wasting until they actually are in, uh, encouraged to collect it and put it to be collected. And I can understand it's a big undertaking to move into food waste collection across the piece forever. But I wonder if there's some merit in a, in a trial of some sort to allow people to understand just how much food they are wasting. Because I think what, what I've read is that the amount that food waste is collected starts up here and once people start to realise how much they're wasting it, it drops off and it then becomes difficult to sustain the collection or to, to cover the cost of the food and, and recycle or whatever. And I just wonder if, if that initial period could be created if you like through some sort of trial to help people understand just you know just how much food they are wasting. Yeah. I'm not sure about the, the actual trial itself, but I think that's certainly an issue we'd want to be thinking about as we scope out the behaviour change piece I mentioned um, introducing the paper, because I think we're keen to understand where residents are on the journey and how best we can help them. So if that's a case of shocking them, as you say, in terms of the food that they're, they're disposing of without eating, then that could be part of the part of the conversation we have so that residents have that understanding and, and avoid buying the food or, or consuming it in, you know, in a more effective manner. The, the question I actually wanted to ask before food waste came came to mind is is to ask whether we're on track to hit the 2025 target, and if we're not, what are we going to do about it? I think there's a lot of work that we're currently underdoing, or we're currently undertaking. I mentioned in introducing the paper again around the energy audit, so that we can understand what our our um, our buildings are emitting and how we can most effectively improve them to meet the standard that we're looking we're looking to achieve. Uh, so I think that that's work we've got in hand. Um, but we're also factoring into that the the kind of the, the offsetting effectively that's um, that we benefit from through the way that we manage our land and the land that we look after on behalf of others. So that's all part of the equation. I think we're working on uh, ensuring that we do meet those targets. But I think if we're not, we need to be kind of raising that as a, as a flag so the members have that awareness that it's only something that we have on, on our work program work program at present. Councillor Pollock Maitland. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to pick up on that food waste point. Um, anecdotally, I know that Hampshire County Council have actually carried out a, a recent study on that. Um, and there's a, a local PhD student in Whitchurch who carried out the study. So perhaps I could put you in touch. Or... Um, and the second point I have is about community facilities um, and to see if there's uh, any possibility for funding. Um, I've had requests for solar panels, also uh, water source pumps. Um, also, I know uh, going through that process myself of trying to get water, <laughs> water source pumps installed, it's actually really difficult and quite a, a complicated process. So perhaps a way of getting community facilities, uh, like a, a, a dummies guide on how to source funding and how to go about it would be a really good start. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Mahaffey. Thank you, Chair. I want to pick up on uh, Councillor Cronin's point earlier about how we recognise 
um, companies that we like that are doing good from a carbon perspective. Sam, I remember we discussed this at least a year ago in a map that I suggested we should have a preferred suppliers list, and you said we were working on such a thing. Uh, have we got anywhere? And, and do we like a preferred suppliers list? And I don't mean just a preferred suppliers list for us. I mean one that we would recommend to um, people in the community. Yeah, I think it's a really good point, and it, it is one I think that residents would find valuable. I guess at the moment, but historically, we've not had the resource to vet, you know, supply. Particularly, you know, people want to know, yeah, can I trust Joe Bloggs to put insulation on, in my house or solar panels or, or whatever it might be, as an example. Um, at the moment, we've always pointed to, um, through things like the, the toolkit that we've got, um, accreditation schemes. So, you know, Trustmark uh, being an obvious one, there are schemes for renewable generation. Um, and there are local suppliers on those lists rather than point, pinpointing specific companies. Um, but I think we are exploring opportunities to look at, you know, for example, things like Green Week, which we've run historically. It's been on a bit of a hiatus for the last couple of years or, or things like that, where you know, local businesses in this sector um, could, you know, could promote themselves via that, that weekend example. So it's still a work in progress. And I think we've, we've never quite um, been able to say, uh, we, we as a council endorse X, and I think it's not, not somewhere we, we're likely to be, but, but trying to find that. Um, I guess interestingly, we, we are also trying to do some work with, you know, as part of some of these kind of energy efficiency schemes, trying to connect that with, you know, in with the colleges, for example, and local installers to bridge that, that gap, you know, the kind of skills gap that people talk about, you know, the need for um, local highly skilled engineers both now and, and you know that demand is, is hopefully only going to grow um, so those conversations are, are at an early stage but also we think that some of these schemes coming will kind of create the demand that gives these installers comfort that they can grow their their companies and, and employ more people uh, develop those skills yeah well, i really would like to see us do more on that because um as i think everyone said already it's there's so much greenwash out there it's very hard sometimes for people who want to do the right thing to recognize good from bad and anything we can do we've, we've done it locally in the silchester we had a, a little fair uh, and we invited companies along that we in our um, in our inexperienced mind had evaluated and thought were good and promoted and the businesses that came along were really enthusiastic about them Lovely. Well, I can't see any more hands waving at me, um, so I shall attempt to sum up again. Um, I think it was agreed uh, that at the next update, the committee would like a comparison to better authorities with the recent rating, uh, but also um, some more information and detail around the EV charges, um, as hopefully that work will have progressed. Um, Committee were keen uh, for officers to look at how we work with and celebrate local green businesses and potentially preferred suppliers. Various concerns were raised around recycling rates um, and the impact that has um, on the environment, um, as well as public transport. Um, green planting, you agreed to um, work with officers um, to look at. Um, the importance of building uh, all the green uh, things like solar panels into planning policy was um, confirmed by committee. Um, uh, many are in EPH discussing it as well. Um, and then also a request for more information and um, funding streams for community buildings to transfer over to green energy. I believe captured everything. And again, nobody is looking at me very crossly like I forgot them. Perfect. Thank you very much. We will look forward to seeing you potentially at our next meeting um, or in July.
Lovely. Councillor Raphael, as technical issues are, I think, dealt with, would you like to introduce this paper? Yes, I will introduce it. In fact, I'm going to steer it through, all of it. Uh, this is the East of Basingstoke Natural Environment Management Plan. This has been cooked up over the last, I think, four years it's taken us from when it became clear that uh, three different parts of the council and three different portfolio holders were all presiding over different things that were happening in the area that we're going to be looking at. And it needed coordinating, and I took on that role, and this is where we've got to. The East of Basingstoke Natural Environment Management Plan aims to have a strategic look at the open space that is within the ring road and outside of the ring road, and to coordinate how it is managed. So it is open space that uh, is natural, some of it is completely unspoiled, some of it is wild, some of it is well used by walkers and cyclists and horse riders uh, and runners and people pushing pushchairs and the like. Uh, it is well used by wildlife uh, and some of it has grazing on it, some of it doesn't, uh, some of it has sports facilities on it, some of it has play areas on it. Uh, and the idea is to see whether we can uh, link up wildlife corridors, link up routes for people to walk, run, cycle and the rest, uh, and to improve connectivity into the centre of Basingstoke uh, for those who are outside of it, uh, as well as obviously giving access to important uh, locations that are outside the centre of Basingstoke for people within uh, Basingstoke. One of the things that motivated me at the start of this was the phrase uh, come to East Rock Park, walk the route of the Basingstoke Canal and get to Basinghouse, the oldest most significant part of Basingstoke. Because without uh, putting, as it were, that jewel in the centre of Basingstoke, Basingstoke still has an image of concrete and roundabouts and yet its history goes back uh, centuries. So it is an overarching project. It includes nature reserves at Millfield. It has what we're going to find out about later this year, the future designation of Crabtree Plantation as a local nature reserve this year. It, part of Crabtree is a grade one park, which from the extension from Hackwood to the south of the M3. It has the source of the River Loddon, as in the first real signs of the Loddon above ground uh, are coming from both um, inside East Rock Park where it comes out to the surface from Black Dam and obviously from the south uh, going towards Junction 6 where they're proposing to put a motorway service station. Uh, so it, it is an important um, area. So there you have it on the map. You can see the different areas and we're going to look at each of them in turn. Um, I hope some of you have seen these slides. They were as an appendix online uh, to the, the papers. Uh, and I'm not going to say too much about the next slide because I've probably said it already. Uh, so we're going to move to, I, I think, East Rock Park? No, where are we going? No, Warmer. Okay. East Rock. No? no so. What's the first one? East Rock on my list. Go on then. Go back. There we are. So we started East Rock Park. And there's a whole range of things that could be done, and we're in that stage of could be done. So what we want to do is just run through these six or seven slides and then listen to you as to what you say. That's really good. We'd really like to see that. Or oh, that's a bit worrying. Can you talk to our residents about that? That type of issue so that we narrow down uh, and prioritise. Uh, East Rock Park is probably the most important park in the centre of Basingstoke for people who come from outside of Basingstoke but want to enjoy being in the centre of Basingstoke, I would suggest, you may have a different view, but that's what I would suggest. Um, it, um, at the moment, in my view, um, does not wholly serve or um, deliver on what it could deliver on. So it is the most important piece of green space for the residents in flats that are around, either uh, in the centre of the town centre or around near the station. And we should always remember that, that it is their green open space, their nearest point of access. 
It has a cafe that's currently closed and should be open. Uh, and it should have, in my view, more than just one cafe. And the current cafe is, a, is part boathouse. Uh, and it's on the south side of the East Drop Park. Um, when it should be on the north side so that you sit out, enjoy the sunshine facing south. It's always good to look at the view to the south, I think. Um, and um, uh, with the water between you and the sun would be a much more enjoyable an aspect than currently um, the seating that's available for it. Uh, within East Rock Park, clearly there are cycle routes available at the moment. There is the route of the Basingstoke Canal, which is broadly in line with that blue sweeping curve uh, the, there from one end to the other. There is the exit out um, to the ring road is uh, a big inhibitor at the moment. There's a tunnel there, but it, when you go to the other side, you sort of wonder whether you want to go to the other side and come back. Uh, and the area to between the middle part and the right is quite um, wild at the moment, which is good. So it's good for biodiversity. And as for the, the uh, River Lodden, it sort of comes out uh, by the left hand P um, and then goes back underground underneath the boathouse and then suddenly emerges to the to the north of the water in that wild area that I was talking about before it then disappears under the ring road. So there's, there's talk within this of whether uh, we should be uh, decanalizing, I think is the phrase, and there's probably another way of pronouncing it, canalizing even, um, the uh, River Lodden, or, or shouldn't we? Because if you do, you've got to create river banks, which actually means less space for other people to enjoy the open space because it's, you've got to uh, widen it out. So th that's a concept that's got to be looked at. Uh, there is, uh, how, how do we deal with the boating lakes? Uh, how, where, what are we doing with cafes uh, and the boathouse and uh, toilets uh, and, and other things besides? Um, and how can we improve the natural environment within it? So uh, that, that's East Rock Park. And I'm going to try and pick up a bit of speed because I've been talking too much. Um, War Memorial Park is the next one um, on my list. And um, one of the things that um, I'm just going to go back to East Rock Park because you stay there. Um, as, um, you'll see there's a line down here and there's a dotted line down there on the East Drop Park. And the idea is that they will have defined routes to, say, go to um, War Memorial Park as well as obviously the routes going eastwards too. So that whether you're a walker or a runner or, or, or someone with children who wants to go from A to B and have a bit of a route to try different play areas or whatever it is that you choose, there are routes that interconnect back and forth between the different areas of open space. Um, War Memorial Park, of course, ha has um, different aspects to it, um, both as a popular venue for, for big civic functions and, uh, and major events, but and obviously it's got a sig um, significant amount of sports facilities within it. To the eastern side, so the other side of the, t the um, whatever it is, totally tennis or whatever it's called, um, the tennis, um, you've got the wilder end, um, and obviously the bits where the circus comes and obviously the, the concerns previously on the common bit there. This will be looking at um, preserving that open space uh, and the natural environment um, that um, is currently on it uh, and seeing how we can improve it and recognising its status um, as common land previously. Um, uh, and that's why it says there, naturalisation of the old common. So there's quite a lot that could go on there. Um, and again, it's about um, seeing what, what, is, what is affordable, what's feasible, what makes this whole area work. And of course, the cut down on the right hand side, there is cut through to Black Dam to go through the Black Dam ponds and use that access to get into Crabtree Plantation right down on the southern side, which you'll see in a minute when we come to the next slide. So it's about connectivity again there and through. Um, clearly, uh, we're, we're probably aware that both of these parks and indeed um, other areas besides we're going to look at, do suffer from antisocial behaviour issues. Um, and this will be as integral to whatever we do, we've got to be uh, enable the, the, the locations to be opened up so people can't get up to their uh, dodgy activities, um, it, as they probably do in the underpasses there and in some of the wilder areas um, uh, of Memorial Park besides. Quick move, let's move. Um, where are we going next? Basin Common. Uh, since, is that right, Basin Common? Since we got cracking on this, Basin Common uh, fell under the management of the council entirely. 
uh, that's because of the, the various quirkiness of, of the trustees, and the trustees was one of the trustees was the mayor, uh, and um, the necessity of working um, uh, and running the common is quite complex. And I think everyone is very pleased that the council's now um, acting as the day-to-day -day caretakers. Um, Tom Payne is over there. I think knows more about that than I do, but I, I think he. I think he's responsible for that. So the common itself is grazed in part. Um, uh, part of the ownership was actually in the western parts of it. Um, so uh, on the right, the far west, you've got the lime pits. You've got Redbridge Lane, which comes off the black, just off the Black Dam roundabout, and runs through, um, takes the, the, the vaguely the route of the Basingstoke Canal. Um, and then cuts round Basing House, which is obviously the, the, the pale area at the top. It's slightly difficult for you to all see back there, but I, I hope you've got the um, idea. And the routes across are historic linkage points. So the, the middle one, in fact, is the, um, is the 16th century route from Basing House through to what was Hackwood before Hackwood House was built when it was the hunting estate going south of the M3. And obviously the A30 was the only thing to be crossed. There wasn't the motorway. Um, the two purple blobs are the suggestions of where there should be much better crossing points of the A30. Uh, and um, if, if we would say what our priorities are, our priorities are to sort, sort that out as a real top priority to improve that connectivity um, at that point. Um, but there are, there are competing interests here because the residents of Old Basing, the dog walkers want to be able to walk the dogs. People want it grazed. The horses want to be there, but they don't want the, the um, rag walk or whatever it's called on there. Um, and so there's a whole competing um, uh, uh, series of interests that have to be managed with this. So, um, moving on. Uh, yes, what have we got? A craft tree. Excellent. So this is south of Basin Common. And the motorway, obviously, you can see um, the, the, this is where we're going to designate it as a local nature reserve. But again, like with Hatch Warren, and Beggar would there be parts where you can have your dogs running around like Willie and Lady, but, and then there are other parts where obviously it's being looked after for, for uh, ground nesting birds and the like. Um, it is technically Grade 1 Park at the moment. The wooded area is the bit at the top, um, and obviously there's potential for all sorts of trim trails or um, uh, some sort of um, uh, monkey world activity up in the trees if people want to do that. I don't know whether that's going to happen or not. Uh, uh, the western side, of course, has the, the water coming through from south of the M3, which is a um, very, very important area of, um, for biodiversity and the source of the River Loddon that we obviously want to protect. Uh, and then the right-hand side is the car park that recently has been uh, had its surface made up, so it's much better than it was uh, uh, a few months back. We've got rid of all the potholes, and it's where the Bolton Arch, um, uh, the Bolton Arch is. And before the M3... The uh, 18th century entrance to Hackwood Park came down there and followed the line of the woodland, which is to the south, because obviously the, the pale strip below is the race course, which isn't currently being used uh, for Hackwood. So that's that. Move, moving on. Um, and then we go to uh, Basing Fen. Again, uh, 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 I would say a very important area. Um, the real jewel in the centre of all of this, uh, unspoilt. Uh, natural environment where the potential to enhance that is immense. The unfortunate part is that it, the, the substantial amount of it is not in the borough's ownership. But the, w we feel that we've got a good relationship with the landowner and we're obviously looking at opportunities to try and see whether that can move forward um, uh, so that we can influence how it is maintained. Um, the left-hand curve at the bottom is the route of the Basingstoke Canal. So if we wanted to restate a path and we had the position, there's various landowners, counties in there, the boroughs in a bit of that, and the private landowners in a bit of that. But if we could get that route on, then obviously then that, that enhances the narrative of what uh, of getting uh, along and following the route uh, to Basing House. Um, at the moment where the big straight line is, is, is effectively where there is a path across at the moment, um, but it needs to be repaired. Um, it's, it's, it's pretty sort of low-slung boardwalks. Uh, and then there's open space above that where an awful lot of antisocial behaviour, sometimes people out on motorbikes and drug dealers and all sorts of things go on. And then the bit at the south is where the lime pits, where a different type of antisocial activity happens down there. Um, and, and, there's a lot, and there's an amphitheatre um, where, I, if, by the looks of things, the, the whole area could be 
enhanced for the benefit of all and made safer. And there's a play area to the south, uh, which um, I think still got signs up with the council with a four-digit phone number on it. Um, it's so old. Yes. <laughs> Um, so, so uh, th th there's great potential here. Um, moving on, is that it? We're there. Okay, so th I hope you've got the theme of what this is all about. It's sort of bringing it to your attention so you all know what's happening. Um, but we're trying to finalise plans. The, the, all of this, we went to consultants. They came up with a whole multiplicity of ideas of things we could do. And we've tried to sort of condense it down into the, the, the more possible. But we have a treasure trove of other ideas that we can go to consultants about. So could we spend just a few minutes hearing what people want to say about potential it'd be good if you did this and bad if you did that type comments please um so members we have a choice we can either ask questions for 10 minutes um and then do the um the committee future work plan and then end the meeting at 10 as previously agreed or we can suspend standing orders a little further in the evening or well, don't suspend them Oh, yeah, just be quick. We can always email the officers. You know, they, they like emails because then they can All right. you know, think in which hard case, about them. Councillor Mackay, be quick. Very quickly, just a word in favour of cycle paths that aren't too narrow and aren't shared with pedestrians where it's practically futile. You're quite right. Thank you. Councillor Mahaffey, then Councillor Tipton. I have to call the Cabinet Officer up on the glaring error of <laughs> suggesting that Old Basing is the oldest and most significant part of Basingstoke. So clearly, the oldest and most significant part of Basingstoke is Silchester, which in 2015 was proven by Professor Mike Fulford to be the oldest medieval settlement in the whole of Britain. But other than that glaring omission, it looks like a very good plan. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, is that right, though? Are the, well, I thought the Bazinga tribe were here before the Romans. But is that wrong? The I have to pull up Councillor Mahaffey on his glaring omission. The oldest site is the Iron Age Fort at Winklebury. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll send the uh, evidence. It was based on an olive stone found in 2015. Anyway, let's carry on. Perhaps, perhaps a future CEP work programme request. Councillor yeah, Tustain. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I really welcome this. I think this is really exciting. And um, having walked around lots of this over my life, it's um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing this develop. Um, and I've completely forgotten sort of olive stones and things. It's completely <laughs> thrown me where I was where I was going to go. Oh, Hampshire County Council. Yeah. So um, how well are they engaging? Because obviously the road crossings and things are going to be one of the biggest issues, mm. isn't it? And stuff. And is there money for this, etc.? Mm. Yeah, I think um, the next stage it will be looking at is sort of like taking these broad concepts and working them forward. Clearly, working with Hampshire County Council is going to be key and sort of like anything we do with roads and also Hampshire County Council in terms of anything that we do with uh, Basing House, whatever, however old it is and nothing with us. So, yeah, um, the next stage will be a lot of engagement with various third parties and partners as well. And, and what Paul means by that is that um, the visitor centre at Basing House may form an integral part of how we interpret, say, the Basing Fen. It may be possible to work with them and use their car park, which is to the north of Basing Village on the Litchfit side, whether that would be something we would work with um, uh, to access this for people who want to come outside and then um, use this area. So there's, there is cooperation. They, they know what we're doing. Councillor McCormick. I, I think it's a very um, promising scheme. Um, it, it's... The, the questions I have is, what more could we do south of the M3? I don't know if you've got any embryonic plans. You've got a race course there. You've got Hackwood Park. Um, you've got well-used footpaths and bridleways ways that extend around the back of Clidston. Uh, is, is this the start of something bigger? Well, I, I can answer that in several ways, all of which are slightly humorous. Um, firstly, I think that would be up to the council not to... Um, uh, grant permission for a motorway service station which would take away um, a big chunk of what was south of the M3 there. Uh, secondly, I don't think the council's got the budget or is going to find the funding to put a bridge across the M3, although I will tell you there, there was within the consultant's report a green bridge proposal uh, across the M3 as well as actually a green bridge proposal um, towards Black Dam Roundabout across the A30. But we, we haven't put them before you because they are sort of pie in the sky options that are just not likely to happen but you could imagine that if there was a bridge across the 
M3, where the Bolton um, arch was, and access to the race course area, which of course is in private ownership, um, still the same owner of the fen, in fact, uh, and the service station. Um, the, the, if, if, um, if, if it was um, uh, an area that had access to, then obviously the potential could be unlocked, but I don't think that's going to happen, I'm afraid. I think, I think we have to confine ourselves to what we have. And the way that I've been envisaging this is that we, we firmly grasp the overall picture but then as we progress how we do it, we look at doing chunks that we can afford, knowing what the bigger picture is and how they fit in. And, and so that we don't end up with a situation of putting a play area in here and then wishing that we put it in over there. You know, that type of uh, dynamic. Lovely, right, no more hands up, so I'll have a go. Um, this was the route of my lockdown walks. Uh, so I know these areas quite well. I would say a couple of things probably. Uh, the footpath between Basin Common and the Lime Pits is like a mud pile at various times in the year so I think that probably should be on your list of improvements if it's not already um, and you're absolutely right about the crossings um, from uh, Crabtree to Basin Common but it's also quite hairy trying to cross as a pedestrian um, from the bottom of Crabtree Plantation into the Lime Pits which is doable um, but you're kind of there's you're racing traffic it's um, very it is it's not i certainly wouldn't do it with a kid i no. <laughs> would do it yeah. yeah um so i think that that should be highlighted as well um i think the other thing that slightly concerns me is we're very focused on people and pedestrians but actually we're not the only things that exist in all this wonderful greenland so um i would like to see in master plans um kind of wildlife corridors yeah. as well and a way that we could coexist with animals and make sure that hedgehogs and foxes and badgers and all sorts can also safely cross the A30 and other major infrastructures. And the, the concept of grazing, just to take one of those um, things, um, it, and the area being more widely grazed um, is something that will, will, will be looked at and we've looked at some options on that. Um, you're absolutely right about green corridors. I mean, that's what it's all about, isn't it? Is to try and interlink these areas and preserve their interconnectivity and stop um, development from cutting things off. So um, well, I'm sure we'll take that forward. Thank you. Thank you all for your comments. And comments were brief. Thank you, committee. Um, so I think generally that was very positively received. Thank you very much for coming to committee. Um, and. People are very keen, I think, to hear more in the future about funding um, and how that could grow. Thank you. Right, last item then. Is it? I hope so. Uh, so, uh, has anybody got any comments um, on the environment, the com community environment and partnerships work program? Um, there's a few items on the upcoming meetings. No, in that case, can I assume that we are in agreement with that? Lovely. All right. Oh, sorry, Councillor Testain. Sorry, Chair. Uh, so we've got the Town Centre Strategy Spring. Isn't Are we not in spring sort of now? Chair, I asked this question at pre-meet yesterday. <laughs> uh, Ian Paul. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the Town Centre Master Plan is going to EPH tomorrow night. Um, as part of uh, a test of the principles before it goes through the local plan process, we've committed to then, following that, bringing a more considered version of that to CEP in, uh, I think, probably the June period. Any other further comments? No. In which case, thank you all for your um, patience and succinctness this evening. It has been much appreciated.